Welcome back, guys. If you've ever watched people on social media and they make claims about different things, and these claims seem so ridiculous, they seem so out there, and you, 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 you have this gut feeling that something they're saying is fake, it's wrong. You ever wondered if there was somebody out there who did checks on that? Well, they, we, my guest today, he, that's what his job is. He calls out fake gurus. He has over almost half a million followers on YouTube where he calls out fake gurus. He's also in the real estate uh, market and he also goes over house hacking. He's got an incredibly interesting channel that all of you should check out. Please welcome Spencer Cornelia to the program. How you doing, Spencer? I am doing great. Thank you so much for the intro. For sure, man, for sure. So that, that's really interesting because you do watch, you know, the word fake news comes out all the time. And one of the things I, I love that you go over is the mental health of a lot of people who will watch. You'll watch somebody, if you've ever been there and you've watched on social media, somebody with this, with this watch or this lifestyle and they're on stage at EDC and blah, blah, blah. One of the things I like to do on my social media is show me taking care of cats. Cause, or, you know what I'm saying? Because I got to take care of cats. My life is not just all standing on stage. I want people to understand I have a, like, my back hurts sometimes. You know what I'm saying? I fucked up my knee, stuff like that. These people, they have this like fake lifestyle and then they use this lifestyle in order to like sell a product or, or come off as a guru. It's really hard to, for me, I didn't understand it initially until watching all your videos, how many people would literally like use the Lambo that wasn't their Lambo, use the watch that wasn't their watch, use the returns that weren't their returns in order to get people to buy into their product. And, um, and so I just thought it was really interesting. The first thing I wanted to come up with is that one about the Ace family who was using their children in order to get clicks on Instagram. The first thing I kept thinking of was narcissistic personality disorder. Over and over again, when I looked at the people that you, you went after, it just seemed like NPD was a very common cause. Have you, have you ever thought about this? I feel like a lot of us have some semblance of it because yeah. we're turning a camera on and yeah. putting ourselves out there for it. But yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting genre on YouTube yeah. where you have people that are using their kids who do not necessarily explicitly give their consent to have their entire lives on yeah. camera. And when they get older, they're going to be on camera. It's a, a weird genre where I understand the criticism I don't, I don't follow too particularly, but yeah. that, that's an interesting family. But, but, but when you talk about with narcissism, like the thing is like, it's a lack of empathy for other people. They're not, when we say what they're using their kids, they're not using their kids because they love their kids. There's no, at no point was this like a function of like, I'm, my kids are going to be better off because I'm doing this. They're simply using their kids for their own like purposes. Oh yeah. And if you watch the clicks, I imagine that if they take their kids out and it's just them, you can see the clear difference of, you can see the obvious incentives, like yeah. use the kids to produce clicks and views. The, the other thing, you want to know, like, the biggest single thing that I see guys say that I'm like, oh, this is a fake guru, is the uh, no drama, no drama, <laughs> or positive vibes only. Bro, everyone, like, for real, right now, if you've been saying positive vibes only, life is not positive vibes only. Life, you stub, sometimes you stub your toe on the coffee table and you say, fuck, it's okay. It's not all positive <laughs> vibes. Whenever I see somebody say no drama or positive vibes, it's like, that's because your life is full of drama. Yeah, that's what life is, and that's what makes yeah. life special, too, yeah. is the ups and downs. Like, you can't, there was a, a quote, or I, I don't know the exact quote, but it's something like, you can't enjoy the bright day tomorrow without the dark night before. For sure. And the joy of succeeding in any endeavor in life is usually in relation to how dark or how deep the not success was. So if you go, let, let's just use a scale of 0 to 10. If you have a 10 out of 10 difficulty of, of failure... And when you succeed, you feel it way more than if your only setback was like a ten dollar overcharge on your phone bill. Yeah, right. Well, I mean, you, and it's really funny because now you say that, and it reminds me of other stuff, like people claiming to be like broken homeless when they weren't. Yeah, then, the rags to riches story just works. Yes. And what sucks is almost everyone in America has some type of yeah, rags to sure. riches, right? It's no one outside of the, okay, the trust, the cliche trust fund kids. How many of those kids are really? Yeah. Well, prevalent? even even so, even some of those trust fund kids, they don't get the trust fund until they're 25, 35 right. years old. And right. they were, they were poor in fucking college like everybody else, you know? Yeah. And poor is in America. It's like that word is so skewed, of course, but sure. like we all have setbacks. That's what makes life beautiful. Like, and that's what makes success so, so, so great. The life isn't meant to have everyone succeed with handouts. There's going to be major setbacks. If you want to go talk to a girl in a bar, they're, they're not just going to all of a sudden, the second you say hi, like give them your number and go on a date with you. Yeah. There are going to be setbacks. If, if you want to make more money, there's going to be people competing with you. There's going to be uh, decisions you make, risks you take with investing that's going to cause you to lose money. It's just part of being a human. Well, one thing I do love is that you talk about the mental health issues that happen when women are constantly using FaceApp to change their faces or when you have people claiming that they're millionaires on crypto when they're not. 
right? Or when you yeah. have people, or sports betting is a big one that you go into where a lot of sports bettors are claiming things that can't possibly be true. And the other one was the models talking about day trading, bro. That one like really, yeah. the models talking about day trading, that one really got to me. And what happens is these people, like you're, they're, it's not just that they're using fame, it's the FOMO. They're using FOMO and it's not even real FOMO. It's the, like Chris, Chris Hemsworth, right? You know how he's got that fitness program when he's clearly on steroids. Like it's a, I don't mind Chris Hemsworth being on steroids because he's playing Thor. And I don't mind Chris Hemsworth having uh, a fitness program. The problem is when he has a fitness program and he's on steroids. And the marketing used to sell people yes. is fraudulent. That's the that's the issue. You know what I'm saying? Like that that becomes problematic. So do, is that it, uh, when the whole self? I'm sorry. When the whole issue with people's mental health comes up, is that a, a common problem that you see? Absolutely. Yeah. I think this is a very important topic, and I've become comfortable with just who I am and how I perceive the world. And that is, I very much do not like fraudulent claims. I have nothing wrong with a sports better that doesn't win. If you make it clear that I'm doing the best I can, I lose $500 a better, you know, whatever it is, if you're transparent, if, if they're doing better than maybe the average public and they sell their picks because the people would lose less money by betting with them, that's one thing that's totally cool. I, just, I really don't like when you sell using fraudulent claims. I've never liked it. I've never appreciated it. I, th I just don't want to live in a world where you can go out and make all these absurd claims about how successful we are day trading or uh, the pickup space is one. Oh, <laughs> yeah, we're, 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 how, uh, you know, I sleep with tens and I date all these beautiful women, but there's never been a picture on your Instagram with bro. a cute girl. Like, come on, man. Bro. And here's, here's what I found too. Yeah. And what's crazy is on social media, there's real influence. There's influencers get a bad rep. I get it. I've seen all the memes and all this. They have real influence and there's responsibility that comes with it. People will buy what you're selling. I've learned this. I've seen the worst sales pitches go, no one's buying this. And then you find out they're making a million dollars a year. And not to clown on the average public, but the million, average person is buying. Million dollars a month, bro. It's I'm, 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 it's looking at, I'm looking at Stripe accounts. Like, cause when I go to some of these affiliate groups or when I go to, uh, you know, elevator nights or something. And I'm, these are not fake gurus, but these are like guys that I know and, I, and they'll show me their how much they're making. The scale stuff. is insane. It's, it's one point, one buddy of mine's doing 1.4 million a month. Yeah, and you're going, wait, what? For a, for a fitness coaching program. And some of these guys are the worst sales pitch and they're making seven figures a year. So yeah. clearly people are buying. Yeah. And I just want to live in a world where the general public has better gurus to follow. And the, the my whole channel from the start, the goal was to separate who is real and fake. Now, yeah. I haven't done a great job with the real. The numbers shift to, it's very yeah, clear. because fake, like fake gets more views. Way more views. And yeah. plus, you kind of get clowned if you promote people. Oh, well, that guy one time divorced his wife and he's a terrible, you know, you just get like weird negativity when you do make a positive video. <laughs> you get negativity when you don't do negativity. Yeah, it's, it's kind of bizarre. So you just, you yeah, end up it's, boxing it's yourself if I, if I go on with like some red pill people and then I, and I'm like, hey, you know, I actually love women and I think they're amazing and I have tons of female friends, bro, the cuck, bitch, like all these words that they say. I'm like, hey man, I'm, I'm dating a supermodel. Like, Loser, cuck, you have female friends, <laughs> fucking worthless person because you you actually speak to women like they're humans. Like, So my my lack of negativity brings me negativity. It's, 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 it's bizarre. crazy. It it's is bizarre. But uh, yeah, the, the numbers are insane. There's, there's real influence. And, and what the other part is when we talked about like when you have a program where there is no metric, right? The feel good program. I love objective data. Yeah. And that's why I, I would love to have a sit down with some of these guys I go after. Let me see your bank statements. So let me see your tax records. Yeah. One thing I really appreciate about Mickey, even though I got, I've never had more shit on a video towards me, yeah. even to this day than Mickey. And look, I'm a respectful journalist. I'm going to report on what is shared with me. He showed me tax statements. He showed up. He allowed me to come to his place yeah. and show tax statements. No one else has done that. Yeah. And I'm just reporting on what I see. I would love to see some of these sports bettors actually show their tax statements. That's all you have to do. You can yeah. shut me up in one second. Just show your tax returns. Yeah. Prove to me. I will sign NDAs. I made it very clear. I'll sign NDAs, confidential, confidentiality agreements. Just prove me wrong. It, it, that, that was so great that you saw. But regardless, let's just say Mickey is telling all the truth or he's not telling the truth at all. You had an opinion and you, new information came in and you changed your opinion. Your negative view on him was not dogmatic. Your yes. negative view on him was scientific. And you were willing, which is very impressive to me. I also like very much enjoyed. I don't know if you watched the Natty or Not videos. Absolutely, like Greg Derek Bouchette, Lo, or Derek yep. More Plates More Dates. When he go when they did the whole thing with um, with uh, uh, my buddy Brandon Carter, right? So he was uh, Der or uh, what's his face? Um, Greg Duchette was saying that. Well, here's a gynecomastia, and here's all this and that. And the way Brandon handled it, I thought was terrific, which was very similar to the way Mickey Mace handled it. Like, hey, let's have a conversation about this, whatever, and let's 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 go over it instead of us getting into mudslinging or yes. something like that. And then you can make up your own mind about yes. it as far as what the truth is. It's very healthy on social media. Part of the part of this game is we all kind of criticize each other. 
everyone does to some degree. If mm -hmm. you're in the fitness space, you're probably, if you see something shady, you're probably going to call it out. That's good. That's healthy. What makes it even more healthy is when then you're respectful of the person to then come on and give them a chance to speak their mind. Now, maybe you don't believe them. Maybe someone comes on and says they've never taken gear yeah. and clearly they have, and, and you let the audience decide, but you at least give them the respect to at least ask them the tough questions. I want to live in a world where you can criticize someone and then they come back and they either prove you wrong or allow that dialogue. One thing your buddy Dan Bilzerian did that I very much respected, he went on Doug Bolk's podcast yeah. and let Doug Bolk ask him the toughest questions. Yeah. I, I love that about him. Yeah, and then the other part was, uh, you had mentioned before that he said that he owned that house, 10979. He never said he owned that house. It was rent to own. He was doing 300K a month. Uh, for the house, well, 300K a month with staff. I actually I, never made a video on Dan. Oh, you didn't? I never did, no, okay. because I I just didn't have any proof the, of any of the claims. And yeah. I didn't I didn't want to be one of these guys who's hyping on a trend, uh, jumping yeah. on the trend and just getting views for view's sake. For sure. I didn't think sure. that was fair. I think, I, I'll tell you what's difficult is I like some of these people and it becomes very hard for me. You know, you I think you made a fair criticism of Chloe when she came on here talking about when she was like shilling a coin. And I love Chloe Ture. I love her as a person. And it's very it was hard because I like some of these people so much. Like I had a really rough situation. You know, I got I got my car keyed by some hater, came on uh, keyed my car. And um and and I made this video. I was like, hey, whoever did this, dude, I forgive you. Cause whoever you are, you're doing way worse than me, right? Whatever. I got a call from Vegas Dave and he was like, bro, whatever you did, that was awesome. That was the best way to pilot. I was like, man, this guy really cares about me. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I thought that was really cool. He had no reason to do this. Vegas Dave's 15 times more popular than me. And he did that. And like, and then people call him out for this and that. I don't know. I like Dave though. That's the problem. You know what I'm saying? I like Dave no matter what. Dave has given me massive. I have that bikini competition at wet because of Dave, uh, what Vegas Dave did. He gave me an opportunity to throw one for him at Dre's. And then the people at Wet Republic were like, you're kicking our ass. We need to hire you. And that's essentially what happened. So it, I think that part makes it kind of difficult too. I remember people saying that about Mickey. Mickey is so fucking, um, he's so charismatic. He is. You, well, there's also, no way to be in a room with this dude and not like him. You know? Yeah, one thing I respected is when I showed up, all of his friends were there. They could have jumped me. I made a video about their friend calling him names. And they easily could have been ugly to me. They said, any questions on the table, you ask me whatever you want. You ask for proof. I'll show you whatever proof you want. Uh, what he said in your podcast with him was very true. He had index cards, yeah. all the timestamps saying, if you need to question me on anything, I'll answer him. And to me, I like that. I very much respect that. Yeah. He yeah. was very comfortable in asking questions, and that's usually a sign of someone that doesn't have anything to hide. That's awesome, man. Um, then the, here's the other issue. It seems like, in general, with things like day trading or sports betting, or what's another one? Um, there's a couple other ones, but... Uh, but it's not that they're a fraud, it's that they can't, Forex would be another one. It's not that they're a fraud, it's that there can't not be a fraud. Do you understand what I'm, mm -hmm. where I'm going with this? It's like, you with the sports betting one, it's like the, there's a VIG there that kind of takes your edge away. Your losses are so detrimental that they suck away all your wins. The people who talk about day trading, like if you compare them to the S&P 500, they always lose. They, it's rare that you find somebody has a five-year run where they even beat the S&Ps. Hedge funds are circling around zero. Hedge funds are, are, are averaging about zero returns because these people, well, yeah, as soon as the fucking corona crash happened, a bunch of them just got wiped out. Tons of them that were heavy wow. longs got wiped out. And then when you deal with the, uh, what's the other one we just talked about? Yeah, with the Forex. Forex, crypto, day yeah. trading, any yeah. of these kind of, any that elicits a pretty quick return, yeah. anything that can make money pretty quickly. But it, it's like you don't even have to do any work because you know they're scams. Like they're, Because yeah. there is no way to... Random market hypothesis. Have you ever heard Robert Schiller? He's a professor at Yale. So he, mm -hmm. won the, he won the Nobel Prize for this. And it was basically the idea that because, like, let's say I have this technique to figure out by using reading these charts, which charts reading is absolute, absolute nonsense. Fundamental and technical analysis, provably false. There is nothing behind them whatsoever. So uh, let's say I have this chart reading algorithm that can help me read these charts and figure out which way the market's going to go. The problem is Jim Simons at Medallion has a better algorithm than me. This I've heard I about this where these hedge funds have all the smartest quants from Yale, Harvard, yeah. Brown, Columbia, yeah. and you're competing with them. Yeah. And it's a very efficient market. I was reading the book, The Incredible Shrinking Alpha, yeah. which this this arena is not my specialty. Yeah. I'm not that knowledgeable here, but the book made a pretty good thesis that it's not possible to win day trading. It's not, but, it, but even for them, the reason why they make money is from um, the bid ask spread. Does that make sense? They're market makers. They'll take the opposite of everyone's action. So here's, here's a way to think about it. If 86% of investors are making a lower return than the S&P 500, which is a real number, it's 86%. If I take the other end of that 86% of action, what, what do I guarantee myself? I yeah. guarantee to make myself more money than the S&P 500. But what do I need? I need $100 billion in order to take the, the other side of all that action. 
That's actually how Medallion makes money. That's actually how BlackRock makes money. They just take the opposite uh, uh, the opposite side of dumb money. And individual in investors are always dumb money. Overall, overall, there obviously are 14% that do better. And if you look at a normal distribution, you have 68.27% uh, in the middle. You have 16% of the each side of the fat tail. So if you add this 16% 16 to this 68.27, you get 84%. And that's essentially what you see with... Uh, the stock market, you see about 84% can't beat the market. And That's it's, fascinating. It's do. Yeah. And One so, theory, oh, were you done? Go ahead. One theory that I have is that a lot of the gurus might not be cognizant of the fact that they're not up. Because if you're oh, not even looking at the numbers, they're, ob they're incentivizing. It's, I can tell you study psychology, so yeah. you understand this, how much cognitive dissonance, because their incentives are to sell you and how successful they are. Yeah. They see their bank account going up. They make a lot of money. They don't differentiate between how much is from selling a course versus profits from yes. trading. And so you over time, I think they actually create a bias. a bias against themselves yeah. where they don't even realize that they're not winning. And with the sports betting specifically, they are winning. Spencer, I have all these winning bet slips. Yes, my my theory, well, it's not really a theory, but my proof and objectivity proof is that you will not win long term. I can use any and, type of math. And they don't post model. them before. Right. They post them afterwards. Right. So they show a lot of wins. And I think that people misinterpret that as they win. I went three for four last night. I won three, lost one. I made two grand last night betting with so-and-so. Over time, you will not win. In a single night, of course, in the short run, anyone can make money. And so I think they there's like huge cognitive biases going on with fake gurus. I remember I was managing one account because I, I do work for a small firm and we were down 600 grand in a week in one of my accounts. And then we came back up like 450,000 in like a couple of days. And I remember thinking, man, if I could just screenshot these returns of 450,000 in a few days and this was all I showed, holy shit, I could make a lot of money just like tricking people. I just remember thinking that and then realizing, oh, this is why all these people are getting fooled because they don't understand over, it's, it's what you do over time that causes uh, you know, the, the upswings and the downswings uh, or causes your overall P&L. Going back to what you said before, it's not, a, so I completely agree with you. The guy who's a sports picker who loses with his sports picks but makes money from selling sports picks, he, his overall P&L for the year, he's paying money in taxes because his overall yeah. P&L is higher. But here's the other part. How about the guy who buys fake followers? And then, but he believes his content is so good that he thinks that he deserves that blue check mark. I know some guys that are like this. They're like, literally, they'll like shit on me for not having a blue check mark or a bunch of followers. And I just like keep reminding them, like, no, your followers are fake. Do you not real remember? Your engagement like, is dog look, shit. Look here, look here. Do you see, we're on Social Blade. Do you see how you gained 70,000 followers in one day? Do you see how that works? Yeah. This is fake. And I also would recommend all of you guys check out Social Blade if you ever are talking to a guy who all of a sudden has 400,000 followers. He has a Lamborghini and he sells a Forex product. Go, go on Social Blade so you can see where he bought all of his... his the to be day. fair, these guys are great investors. Yeah. You buy the Lambo on, on loan. Yeah. You rent the house and you buy the followers. Let's say 20, 30,000 upfront investment yeah. or possibly a little more, but you make it way back in, in whatever you're selling. Yeah. Isn't it to crazy? Be fair, it's nuts, man. The scalability was... This whole world was is so new to me. And then once I, I felt like I jumped into an ocean and I could see everything under the ocean, I was like, oh my gosh. I but see it goes it forever. It's nuts, man. I just, my initial videos were just simply, I wanted to do an objective, objective look at a lot of these gurus that you, you hear about, the Ty yeah. Lopez, Robert Kiyosaki. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you start diving into this world and you start realizing not only the money that is made, how prevalent it is that people are, and I don't, I don't want to label everyone a fraud as if I'm this like judgmental person. Yeah. I'm the perfect person. You're a fraud. But buying followers, buying engagement, buying, or not necessarily buying screenshots, but presenting only the screenshots that you want to share. And sure. I'm in real estate. I could share, I make, I grow something like 13K a month. I could say, I make 13K a month. Oh, come on, man. I'm in real estate. You know how many expenses there are with mortgage, taxes, sure. insurance, capital expenditures. You could, fr you could fake all this stuff. I, I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it sucks. And like I said before, some people don't have objective metrics. Like my objective metrics is, did you feel good about yourself today? There you go. You can't ask for a refund because yeah. you felt good about yourself today. And that's the problem is that they can't, they can't put some of these things up. But man, you make yes. so much money. Go ahead. Here's what's really important too. Mm -hmm. The idea of feeling good. So um, let's say you know nothing about woodwork, okay. right? You know nothing about anything about woodworking. If I made a course on how to create this table... To you, it, it, whoa, that's amazing. I've never even thought about all that goes into making a table. It could be the worst information. I could be the worst. I could give you the worst advice. But to you, since you're new to this concept, everything seems great because you went from zero to one or whatever. 
And I think a lot of courses do the same thing. And that's why there are a lot of positive testimonials. So I just look like a hater. I'm saying this course is, or this person's a fake guru. They don't know what they're speaking about, but all their testimonials are, are great. Well, that's because if you know nothing about real estate and I teach you about mortgages, I have friends that I, uh, I, I've been taking boxing classes. I have friends that know nothing about debt and they're like so shocked. And I'm like, I love taking on debt. I, I'm in a race to take on more debt because that means I have more real estate and yeah, I have more cash flowing assets. For sure. And they, it, the, the concept blew their brain. Well, if I had a course where I taught them the idea of debt being good in the, in the, within the context of real estate, it blew their mind. But this is like the most basic level information in finance. So to them, it could be the most amazing information, but I could be, a, I have no finance degree. I could be seen as a fake guru. Anyway, the point being that you can teach someone if zero to 100 is the scale, the timeline of knowledge in one specific context, you could have a course teaching them zero to two and they're paying for what should be zero to 50, right? And that's where I have a problem too. You know what else is crazy is, so like Stephen Lau, you know credit? I do. I actually uh, talked to him the other day. Yeah. I, I met him. So, so I don't know anything about his course. It seems like it's probably pretty good for him to make this much money, but how does he do, do, do his marketing? He's sticking like credit cards into strippers' mouths <laughs> on his social media. Like hey, Nicolette Shea, who's a friend of mine, he's like putting an eight ball in her fucking mouth with her humongous 1200cc boob job. And like, and I, I show this to my clients because some of my clients are like, Michael, I'm very afraid because I have a nine to five job and I don't want to post this stuff on social media. And I'm like, hey, look at him fixing her credit. Do you see it? I stick in the eight ball in her mouth. This guy has more money. He makes more money in a month than you make in 10 years. What the fuck are you talking about? Like, just get out there and do it. It's like, it's not a fraud. It's just like going a completely different direction and using the, the Lambo, private jet it works. And, and it, Look, works. it works and it works it works <laughs> at the end of the day it works i just love how credit like nothing on his ig about like, fixing your credit and yeah. yet people go crazy and like want to want to be involved with it yeah it's just it's really an interesting uh, how do you want your brand to be perceived i think is the best question well right? here's, the, here's the other thing it seems like there's no downside to doing anything do you see my yeah. point like like again you 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 live in a country where we elected a man who fucked a porn star while his wife was pregnant <laughs> and you still elected him there seems like there's no downside to doing any dude, Kendall, or um, you know, when when uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Caitlyn Jenner, she runs over a dude while she's drunk. I've heard about this. Kills him, and woman of the never year. Never seen jail. Never seen jail time. Like I, again, it seems like again, who when it comes to the sales tonalities being a closer, who's one of the main people in the U.S. We think Cardone of Cardone and Jordan Belfort. Jordan fucking Belfort, who went to jail for 15 months for securities fraud. I love Jordan Belfort. Don't get me wrong, mm -hmm. but like think about this. He is like he is famous for hookers and quaaludes <laughs> and taking your money and investing it. Improperly. I'm not fucking leaving. I'm not fucking leaving. <laughs> I'm not fucking leaving. He's famous for quaaludes. It's like when you Google quaaludes, his name comes up. He made it cool, and he makes so much money. That's the other thing. It feels like there's no repercussion for any. Of, you could get completely caught red-handed in any of this shit, and you're still famous. Like how? What was uh, Ja Rule? Ja Rule is still after yeah. the fire festival, bro. Ja Rule is Untouched. still making money from doing appearances. He's more famous. I saw Ja Rule the other day at some party, and like people are coming up wanting to take pictures with the man who ripped them off. And how about this one? The best one of all. P these girls in Florida who are doing TikToks with OJ Simpson. Oh, that no. shit is fucking mind blowing, <laughs> bro. Like what planet are clout. we? On? Anything for clout? You know, it'd be a fascinating book yeah. that maybe your buddy could write. Yeah, is this obsession with fame that is now becoming so prevalent yeah. and so obvious to us? Like anyone with clout. Yeah, it's it, it's like inherent within us. If you have clout, you just want to. Like Logan Paul, I'm a big fan of Logan Paul, I like yeah. his content, but like this guy goes out in public and just like people I, you, you see on the vlogs, people just want to be around you. Even if you're in this, this moment of time where you're hated, Andrew Tate, yeah. it sounds like you're friends with him. Yeah. Like he's so hated, right? But yeah. he, anytime he goes out in public, you just see people just want to be like just anything, Bro, pictures it, with him, it's, talk it, to him. It's girls hit it's me nuts. up and tell me how much they hate him. Cause, but, but to be fair, I was friends with Andrew before he became famous. Uh, not famous. He maybe had 400,000 followers and no blue check mark when I first met him. The, uh, uh, so and then the same girls would like want his number. You know Nuts. what I'm saying? Like, is he hot? Like, the, I, I'll have girls be like, I hate him and he's super fucking hot. I'll have, <laughs> I'll have women absolutely say that to me. That's it's, wild. It's fucking mind blowing. So like, going back to the Logan Paul thing, one of the, the examples I like to make is like, who could get in front of venture capitalists faster? You or me or Logan Paul? Logan Paul probably. Oh, right, right. But Logan Paul's not famous for venture capital. Right. He's just famous. That's it. And they, they, this goes back to uh, one of the tenets of men of action is status is status is status. When I meet girls who are like the best girls I've ever met, like low body count, fucking you're super beautiful, in the gym all the time, family, women, multiple master's degrees, run their own company. When I meet their boyfriends, 500 body count. The guys who've like slept with like six, like yep. male strippers with fucking neck tattoos. 
it's like former men, like gigolos. Like, and you're like, what in the world's going on? Why? Because we as men, sometimes we start thinking, because we judge women and I, I try not to, but like when we judge women is this is a good girl. This is a bad girl. We start thinking our status is the same way. This right. is good guy status. This is bad guy status. Take a look at machine gun Kelly before yeah. you start thinking of good guy status or bad. Like, look at, like when you see Ke Kendall Jenner, is that the one with Travis Barker? Which one's with Travis Barker? I can't remember. Kendall or Kylie Jenner, whatever. It doesn't matter. Look at, look at Travis Barker. And then he's with these fine ass women, yeah. like anyone he wants. Stop thinking there's good guy status and bad guy status. I there's just status. Your president fucked a porn star and got elected. There's just status. Yeah, clout is also a word you could you throw in there for Instagram clout. specifically. Yeah. But I've, I have this belief system and mm -hmm. I'd love to share it with you. Yeah, you're one sure. of the few people I feel like I could have this conversation with. So I did cold approach pickup. I was obsessed for from sure. 2012, 2015 We're, we're skipping ahead. We were gonna talk about this for a while, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So. I was super into this world and loved yeah. the idea. And once you get that superpower, you actually go out and you're like, oh, that cute girl, you you can go talk to her and for get sure. her number. Sure. Wait, before I had, to, I had to be friends with her friends. and get, Anyway, mm -hmm. so you do this thing and then I realized there was a ceiling for yeah. me and I would go into a bar and the cute girls over there, there was some discrepancy between how I perceive myself and I couldn't, I would never walked up to them confidently. And I realized I need to improve my status, my lifestyle, my income, wealth, career, how I perceive myself, all this stuff. And so I, I focused specifically on gaining as much status as I could. That mm. was my pursuit. Yeah. I believe personally that after guys go through that little sleep with everyone phase, I think they should pursue status above all else because my opinion is status is like an umbrella, money, if you want like the clout game and access to women through clout, like that's obviously becomes available, but also who you, who you meet. For sure. Like, dude, I was working at a desk job two years ago and now I'm hanging out with people with like real clout, like you, like real clout. I don't have real clout yet. Maybe yeah, no, you, you, you hang out with all like these successful people. Yeah. But anyway, my social circle now is with some of the people that are biggest on the platform. And this yeah. was in, within two years. My income's gone up, my connections, my social circle, the yeah. quality of people I hang out with, all this has gone up specifically because I have like some clout on YouTube. And I would be curious to hear so, your so opinion of that. Let's look at this. So, so let's like say status is the overall set, and it, there's two subsets. We'll tell you one of them is called clout, and the other one is called competency. Okay. So a competency, like you're famous because you're really good at what you do, right? Michael Jordan would be a, an example of having status because of a high level of competency. And with that comes clout as well. And then some people they don't have a high level of. Con I'm not saying that Logan Paul doesn't have a high level. Obviously, he's probably he's an incredible podcaster, very very talented uh, content creator. But his clout is what, where he gets his status from. Does yeah, that make and the sense? Kardashians are always the best example. They're they were great, the, the great, famous for being famous. Famous for being, idea. that's a great example. Fam famous for being famous. I, I don't like to put Paris Hilton in this category because she makes you think she's way dumber than she is. She's yeah. way smart. That woman is a billionaire. She has more, Paris Hilton has more money than Kim Kardashian. A lot of people don't realize this. 100% she does because wow. she has that makeup line. Now, Kylie may have more money than Paris Hilton now, but Paris was a legit B billionaire without Conrad Hilton's money, without her great-grandfather's money. So that's, that's one of the things that I thought was really interesting is that um, so clout is just the thing where I'm famous for being famous, but competency was another thing. I, like for instance, uh, Dr. Buss is famous for being competent, not for the for the clout. I wanted this pro this program to be an expression of both. You kind of call people out for just the clout with no competency. So they have yes. status with clout with no competency. When we talk about I need to improve myself, not everyone, not every one of our clients or everyone who follows you or everyone who's in pickup or everyone who's in red pill or whatever, they, not all of them can become famous. Like Bilzerian talks about fame brain. They yeah. can't all become famous, but they can all become competent. They can all become the best engineer at their work. They can all become the guy on social media who like just has the coolest photos, travel photos of mm -hmm. their of their small group of friends in Des Moines, Iowa or Wichita, Kansas. They can all let increase a level of competency which gets them to a level of status. That's that's possible that's possible to do. But like I, th I don't think everyone can become famous, right? And that's right. interesting because you talked about you wanted to gain as much status as possible in yeah. order to get to that place. And it is really interesting because like if I took you on stage at, uh, at Zook, I promise you somebody would recognize you. More than me, obviously. You have half a million followers on, on YouTube. And we would do that, and you would see this this kind of thing where like, you've done all this work for Cold Approach, and like, I'll take you on stage at Zook, we'll be behind Dead Mouse, like five feet behind Dead Mouse, and it'll be the most beautiful woman you've ever seen in your life, and you do no work. And the reason why is the crazy part. When I, I, I The first time I experienced this was at the Playboy Mansion. We're at the Playboy Mansion, and every I'm thinking these girls are gonna be mean as fuck to me, because I'm nobody. 
because I'm in the Playboy Mansion. You got past the velvet rope. They're so nice to me because they think I'm some TV producer Mm -hmm. or they think I'm some reality star or I'm an athlete. The more mystery, the better. That's exactly right. Who is that guy? Why is he here? Why do I not know him? Just getting on stage at XS, just getting uh, to the marquee sky deck during EDC, just getting in the Playboy Mansion, just getting into the VIP of the Maxim Party, just standing there. Girls are just like, who is this guy? And they have to be nice to everyone. Yes. When I was in the cold approach game, and that was one of the most important parts of my life. And Can you put the fan on me? Go ahead. Keep going. That was one of the most important parts of my life. And I learned a lot about dating, women, cold approach, uh, communicating with women, everything, uh, all the above. But I found I was in Houston at this time, and I was going out six nights a week yeah. doing the typical like young 20s, yeah. you know, hardcore cold approach pickup. And I found myself, when I went to the bar, the kind of the higher status bar, when you have the cute girls, all four girls at a table, I didn't feel confident going and talking to them. In this game, I just felt like the game was rigged against me. It was sure. almost like when you're investing, you're like, but it, it, I'm it not is. seeing something. It, it is. is. It is. The bar yes. rigged it against you. The bar yes. wants to shit on you for being poor. Always yes. remember that. In a nightclub in Vegas, there's a girl guy. His job is to go find all the pretty girls in GA and pull them away from GA so that cold approach pickup artists have no shot with them. Take them to a table with a guy with a 15K minimum. Make those girls drink all his alcohol so he keeps buying more bottles. That is the business model. Yeah. Two shit on the low status people. Always remember that. Go ahead. And I, I had this belief at the time where I saw it. I was like, I don't believe I can attract these girls with any type of consistency. Mm. How do I gain? And when I say status, I'm not some guy that's like out to clout chase. I'm not like trying to be famous for famous. I just wanted, I just want, I saw what the benefit was with you. Ha- when you have like a blue check on Instagram mm. or you have a social circle full of very successful people, whether that's on Instagram or business people, I just wanted to be around that group of people. Well, anyway, um, what I really respect about you is you were always on the periphery of this RSD and I would see you and go, okay, this guy is the only one that's hanging out with beautiful women. Mm. All the other guys claim to be. He's hanging out with beautiful women. That I can see the way they react to him. You had this philosophy of being friends with them, and I could clearly tell that they respected you, and they looked at you as an equal friend. The, the women. The women did. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I was like, okay, this guy seems to have it. And then and th- at that point in my mind, I was like, I'm not playing the right game. I want to play a game where girls have some type of perception of me up front, where they're, we're at least on equal playing field. I know this is like an uncomfortable talk- topic for a lot of people, and I know you know where I'm going, Yeah. is... It's not an equal playing field. Like if you walk up to a girl and she doesn't know who you are and she's really hot in a bar and she knows she's hot, like good freaking luck. Yeah. You need, you need like the best verbal game. And I just didn't have Or, or kindly Myers as a wingman. That's another thing that helps. And we've talked about that before. So anyway, that's, that's what I'm getting at is I wanted to live a life where I was around successful people and I had cute girls with me and going to the bar. Not one of these lone pickup guys that you, you and your buddy go out in your $10, you know, button down t-shirt. So here's, here's the problem. The, the problem is the way pickup was taught was that cold approach was 100% of pickup and that there right. was a subset of pickup or game called social circle. That right. is incorrect. I don't even call it game. It's just being a normal human. That is social circle. 2% of game is cold approach. Cold approach is inbounding the basketball. Uh, social circle is the entire game. Right. And this is it, the way it's taught, though, is because the metrics are so unattainable. You feel good about yourself because you approached a woman. Now all of a sudden it's like, well, I feel good about myself. Therefore, I'll just keep doing more and more cold approach. And that, and then here's the other thing: if you have ever seen me with a, a successful interaction with a woman, it is boring as shit. <clears throat> I lean in a couple times. She laughs. I don't touch her at all, and we just leave together and go go eat like at a, a pizza place in the middle of the night. It's so boring. If you filmed me, it would be like, dude, this is the most boring shit ever. But what do, what do we see with the infield videos that guys were doing? It was yeah, they were spinning them around, monkey. dancing yeah. monkey. They would bark on them. They would lay on the ground. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah. they would spit. I was one of the big one <laughs> of the guys nice. I've been told over and over again was the greatest PUA of all time. I'm sitting there hanging out with him, and he's barking at this girl. And I and I, I take him aside. I'm like, hey, bro, these girls know me. Like we, they'll leave with us right now. They like me. Right. You don't have to bark at them. Yeah. They'll go home with me. But it was so funny because he couldn't transition from cold approach to like uh, like the, the social circle part of it. The other thing was, you know, my, my affiliation with RSD, I was just going out every night in LA and there was just these dudes and I was just alone. I fucking hate LA. And I was just like, ah, these guys are funny. Like, you know what I'm saying? And some of them are like, they're trying so hard. And some of them were just kind of like this lovable, like nerdy guys. And they had like, they were coming from a good place. And I was like, okay, fuck it. I'll go out with you guys. And then I would try to like get them into clubs and it was a disaster. It never would work. And, and I would introduce them to females and I was like, Hey, this is my female friend. And the guys are like, I don't, what do I do with your female friend? I'm like, yeah, just hang I don't have that skill set. I don't understand. I don't understand that. Skill. <laughs> I know how to go talk to her if she's standing on the opposite side of the bar, but I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I was like, Hey, <laughs> but, uh, dude, I would have girls come into LA when I was in Vegas. I was like, Hey, take care of my home girl, take her out with you guys and have a good time. And these PUAs were like, so confused. Like, what do you mean? Take her out with us. I don't know how to do that. 
And uh, you know, I just saw that happening, that, that the whole situation happening over and over again. I was just friends with Owen and them, and they would ask me to speak at stuff. I didn't make any money from any of the, that affiliation, not one single penny. They did not pay for my hotel rooms. I've never worked for RSD. It was just a function of like, hey, you guys are trying to improve yourself. Cool, if you want me to speak, I'll come, I'll come help you and speak. And meanwhile, I was just, you know, I was working in finance and hosted bikini competitions. That's all I was doing. I didn't make it as a business until December, or, or December 2019. I did none of that. And so it was a, it was just a a, lifestyle. Yeah. That's what I love, man. And as much as I clown on a lot of these gurus, I respect a lot of it. The fact, the freedom that they have and they live a cool lifestyle. And I know a lot of it is fake in the sense that they're just showing the highlights, but yeah, I, I can't deny that a lot of uh, what you show a lot. I want, I want that life. I would love to live a life where you have beautiful women around you and you're going out and being social two nights a week or so. I like making videos where I like shoot free throws. You know why? Because like, what am I, I'm not trying to clout you. Yeah. I'm just hitting free throws. And it's a meditation in a beautiful place. I'm not like, do you understand what I'm saying? Like, I want to teach you a skill set where we teach, I want to be, teach you, hey, we can be friends with women. That's not, hey, here's 10,000 a month that you're going to make. Let's just, can we just treat women like normal people? Right. And then here's what happens when you do. You have these amazing women in your life who introduce you to other women. That's not like some ridiculous promise that I'm trying to make. I'm, I don't want to come off like a guru like that. I'm just, and then when, when I base stuff, it's not like, this is my experience banging all these chicks. You have never heard me say that. What do I say? This is what Dr. Buss says. This is what Leah Cosmides says. This is what Steven Pinker says. This is what um, Satoshi Kanazawa says. This is what David Allen says. This is what evolutionary psychologists say. This is what Dr. Gad Sad of Concordia University, this is what he says. That's where I get these ideas from. And then once I do that, then anecdotally, I can be like, well, I'm friends with these girls. They introduced me to more girls. It is freaking incredible. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. Have you ever done cold approach? Did you ever get into that world? So at I all? used to work. I was a, a pro. Here we go. I was approach coach for mystery for a, a, a couple oh. of years. Yeah. For like two years, uh, but mo- more for love drop, like love drop, uh, Chris Odom. Chris would like, they'd say, Hey man, we're going to go to a boot camp. Do you want to come? And they would, they would just come. They would get me a hotel room. That was it. They wouldn't pay for my flight. And for two years I would go help them. And it wasn't like pickup. I would just have no fear. I have no fear going up and talking to strange women, but it was, ne- I was not doing what they were doing. I was yeah. literally going up and just like making friends. way healthier approach, yeah. man. Like looking back, I think there's, there's good from the pickup world of going out and getting over yeah. that fear of talking to a girl you find cute and getting mm. over the fear of just asking for her number and understanding uh, progression and mm. her consent. Like do you ask for her phone number? Do you ask her on a date? Like all these steps. Mm. But man, looking back, there are a lot of unhealthy behaviors in that world. That and the red pill is now when it turns when it turns to misogyny. Yeah. That's that's kind of the issue. And like misogynists don't think they're misogynists. I, I was talking to Rolo and we, you know about this whole th- situation. Rolo thinks that less than one percent of the guys in red pill are misogynists. I don't agree. I think it's way more than one percent. I don't think it's fifty percent. They don't, don't enter the space with a healthy mindset. Yeah, I, that's I think for sure. I, I think what what happens is we're we're like looking at this the wrong way. It's like ah. Uh, if I see them differently, I don't know, I don't want to go too far down this road, but I don't think it's 1%. I yeah, think, but not. I don't think it's 50% either. I think feminists have this whole idea that everyone in red pill is like some fucking MGTOW incel. That's not true either. Right. A lot of them, it's just, it's one of these situations, like if I'm a man and I want higher status and I want to be with women, I, like I count also. And there's this feeling, especially coming from Hollywood, that like my desires don't mean anything like i don't have the right to improve myself like Mm -hmm. the idea of men improving other men is offensive to you that's a problem that shouldn't be offensive to you you know what i'm saying you just you should just show up as a teenager and you should be the man just be just Just get it bro just get it you said something just get it bro (laughs) just get it what was it uh it was a quote that was women say just be yourself so they can pick out the losers yeah. quicker that's so true it is the it, worst advice ever is just be yourself yeah oh my gosh it is like again you were just yourself and then you went to did pick, pick up and then you worked on your status so there was two yourselves yeah. yourself is a fluid concept absolutely become and it's always well hopefully it's always improving yeah. into the best version of yourself the best version of yourself is probably the best way to it's put so it. funny i was so fat when i was in the military because i was flying air crew we do they do not push you to get into really, really good shape. I would run a lot, but I was not, I was eating like shit. And I, th- that was who I was being myself, man, eating fucking like triple cheese water burgers. That was being myself. I needed to change who be myself meant. And then I switched to a paleo diet, intermittent fasting, you know, cardio every day. That's what I changed to who myself was. And the fun, like, that's why I got this whole thing. It was like, whenever I'm in a relationship or whenever a girl really likes me, she's never asking me to do things to make more money and to get in better shape. It's always the opposite. Stay it in. Let's watch Netflix. Don't talk to that girl. I don't like that you posted. It's just so funny that, that, that you know, that's kind of the perception that happens. <laughs> sure. It is funny. All right. Anyway, let's let's get back, dude. I'm talking way too much. Let's go. Let's go. Let's just stick to you. Let's talk about Atlanta. You. So I I, I was stationed at uh, Robbins Air Force Base for three years. Oh, cool. Well, five to eight. You started. Grew up in Atlanta. Correct. What kind of upbringing? You said you had a kind of a strict upbringing. 
I had a great upbringing. Yeah. Looking back, I probably had the best upbringing. I grew up in Kennesaw, Georgia, which is Northwest Atlanta, Cobb County, Georgia. The prototypical healthy middle class. I have never seen my parents curse at each other, raise a voice at each other. I've never raised a voice at my parents. That was just the environment I grew up in. You just didn't disrespect the people in your family. Like, it was very bizarre to me. I've still never cussed in front of my mom. Yeah, and then when I moved out west, and I've moved uh, eight times since high school through for, for various reasons, uh, all throughout the country, and I started seeing all these people who had divorced parents, and they grew up in tr- tough upbringings and the, a lot of toxicity, and it was very foreign to me. I feel like I had the best childhood. Really nice middle-class household, no problems, no stress. Anytime I needed to do something, my dad paid. That was just the environment I grew up in. For sure. And I didn't realize, I, the moment I realized how privileged I was, uh, my grandparents both lived on Hilton Head Island, South Carolina. Of course. Very familiar, beautiful area. Beautiful. And my gra- the, the house I went to, my grandma's house. It's just my grandma's house, right? That's where yeah. we went to. Well, she's recently moved on to a, a so, like one of those healthcare facilities. Yeah, for sure. And she sold her house for like $1.1 million, oh, And it's beautiful. And now that I'm older, I'm like, oh, yeah, that was my grandma's house. It's like ridiculously nice. Yeah. And yeah, you realize kind of how privileged I was very privileged growing up and I'm not af- afraid to admit it. Do you know, you know, the thing about Georgia. So I lived there for a while. The one, the, the food obviously is one of the things I missed. The other thing was when we, if you and me wanted to go shooting today, like one of these places, like 400 bucks for like 30 rounds of ammo. It's like ridiculously expensive here, here. in Las Vegas, in Las Vegas. Have you ever gone shooting here? No, I haven't. Georgia is the cheapest place I have ever gone shooting in my life that you, you take out there. They give you like a bucket full of ammo. You go out to a hill and you start putting bullet. <laughs> you put rounds in a fucking berm oh, and yeah. you sit there and you're shooting for eight hours with a, like a big old fucking 308 and a bunch of machine guns and whatever. Like in Georgia, you can shoot. Everybody's got guns. Oh, bro. yeah. So my, my parents, middle midway through high school, we moved about two hours outside Atlanta to a nice golf course, mm-hmm. gated, like resort community kind of very nice area. Yeah. And the high school I went to, one of my classmates was, he's a two-time Olympian, maybe three-time now, gold winner at skeet shooting. Yeah. And so he had, his whole yard was skeet shooting. You just, you just went out in the backyard and started shooting. It's and, just so, uh, cut. gun <laughs> way, ownership way there is so high. And like, if you want to go, like, again, for what you could get for 30 bucks there would cost $250 here. Yeah, it's crazy. Oh, I had no idea. Yeah, I'm not go, into that stuff, into yeah, shooting at yeah, all. Yeah, if if, that's the only thing I don't like about Las Vegas is that there's so many places to go shoot, but they're not affordable. Like, compared to Texas or Georgia, they're not affordable at all. I just, like, I want to take a girl on a date, and I'm like, I just spent $475, and it was 25 minutes. This wow. is stupid as shit. This is so dumb. I have one clip in an MP5. Come on, man. This is dumb. That's why that's the only thing I don't like about this place. And anyway. pick, if you're still in the pickup community, they would say, don't pay for a date, right? That was the whole thing. I don't care. I like shooting. I like shooting guns. <laughs> I don't give a shit. Yeah, that was kind of a stupid mindset. Isn't it funny that the, the sort of binary mindset when it comes to that? It was like, if you're a gentleman, again, well, here's, here's where the issue comes from. And here I go talking too much. I apologize. But you can't give value unless you have value. For so, sure. So if you have no value and you start paying for dates and you start paying for drinks, of course, she's going to just, she feels comfort with no attraction. But if she's very attracted to you and you pay for a date, you've built attraction and then added comfort. Now she really likes you. Very good combination. Yeah, for sure. Women don't just sleep. Sometimes they do. I know some women that are just only into like male strippers or whatever, bartenders that are super good looking. Some women only need attraction. Most women most of the time need attraction and comfort. Men do not need comfort at all. So it's a situation where, uh, you know, she'll meet a guy. He's like super attractive. And then, but he doesn't seem relatable or attainable. And then he'll do something sweet for her. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, now I have comfort. I feel special along with me being super attracted to him, then she wants to go home with him. That's the whole difference. So that's why the whole don't ever buy a girl a drink is just binary advice for very binary people. And I'm sure yes. you noticed when you were going to those pickup things, a lot of guys were on the spectrum. Yeah, a lot of guys were sure. on a lot of well, guys. And were also AMD. to be fair, if you don't have any value, like you alluded to, if you are trying to buy something or try to win her approval by taking her on a date and paying for a fancy thing, well, then she can sense that, right? Of course, so there's like the, the obligation. all the nuance and everything that goes yeah, to it. I, so girls would come visit me sometimes just because I live in Vegas and I live on the Strip. So they'd come visit me. If I took their luggage and put it in the guest room and I was like, hey, here's the guest room. Have anything you want. I got towels for you, whatever. It was so funny. They would follow me to my room and be like, no, I'm staying in your room. If I took them to my room and put, put the luggage in my room like you're sleeping in the bed with me, they'd be like, no, I'm going to sleep on the couch. Uh, the same thing happened with the photo shoots. If I if we had a photo shoot and we told the girls, hey, we want you to shoot in lingerie, the girls were like, yeah, I'm not really sure I'm going to come. But if we told them you can shoot in whatever you want, they'd shoot nude. Interesting. It's the obligate guys. It's the obligation that's the problem. It's not the drink. It's not the being nice. In a way, it's like the expectations. Correct. It's not the opening the door. It's not the chivalry. It's the obligation. If you're chivalrous and she knows you have options, then she doesn't feel obligated and she's still attracted to you. If you you have status, again, when you go up to a girl you don't know 
uh, and you're like, oh my God, you're so beautiful. Just imagine a homeless person coming up to you and being like, oh my God, dude, you have nice shoes. You'd be like, well, thank you for the night, you know, the compliment, but dude, back up, you know, right. but that's exactly what it's like. But if, if, if Justin Timberlake goes up to some girl, he's like, man, you're absolutely beautiful because he has so much value. Yes. And what you're explaining is give what value. you're explaining it better. What I, what I really meant when I was in this like pickup phase and I had this mindset of getting status, I... I wanted to have the, a higher perception of value. Of course. And look, I, I would love to talk to, about this with you too, is the idea of like when you're a young man and you're in your 20s, you aren't making any money, you're a little directionless with your career. For sure. You feel like a ghost. Mm. You feel irrelevant. And when you're, especially in pickup, when you're like trying to go get with a lot of, a lot of girls, a lot of girls that you find attractive, you, you just you, feel you, irrelevant. You don't feel like a ghost. You are a ghost. You 20, are a ghost. Dude, they don't even know you exist. 26% of men report zero sexual partners, or 28% oh, of men man. report zero sexual partners in the last year. And then the, the, this is a, a 2019 study. And then the other part was 27% of men report being a virgin until they're 30. 27%. Oh this God. number spiked after after wow. the the the, uh, the iPhone, the iPhone didn't help men get laid. The iPhone helped the top twenty percent men get all the girls, right. and it hurt the bottom. So when you're 28%. playing this game, and it's the same way I view you, investing. But, but, but my oh, point is, going. my point is, you don't feel like a ghost. You are legitimately <laughs> a ghost. Yes, uh, with investing, I like to view investing like where is your edge? Where mm -hmm. can I beat the market? Same thing with dating. If I'm playing this game where I'm going out and spending all this energy on dating apps, swiping, going out to bars, trying to cold approach, if I'm out shopping, like cold approaching, that's where the energy is. You're playing a game that's a losing game. Yes. It's incredibly hard. You're playing a numbers game. I don't think it's worth your time. And so what I feel like in life, you're going to spend time doing something, right? We also have the same amount of awake time every day. So I felt it was more appropriate to pursue income, status, and career because I think then women will find you in the sense that you have very successful friends. They'll introduce you to your friends. Like recently, I had a friend introduced me to a girl, a girlfriend's friend, and it was like seamless, because she saw, I was like, oh, he's successful on YouTube, mm. he's got this great group of friends. It was so seamless, it was way different than cold approach. But there were so many other things. The fact that a woman introduced you means For, yes, his yes. breath doesn't smell. <laughs> he doesn't grope me. Right. He's not ho horribly inappropriate. He doesn't pull his dick out in inappropriate times at dinner. Right. <laughs> I know I know it seems weird, but you understand, as a man, we look at women, if, we, if you met a woman who's the most perfect physical specimen you've ever saw, and she comes up and she starts spouting off political beliefs that are a nonsense, starts talking about astrology, and then just randomly grabs your dick out of nowhere, you'd still go out with her. You would absolutely consider 100%. it. hundred <laughs> percent. Because, because what you find attractive in her is so narrow. For a woman, she's like, can he dance? Does he have money? Is he lying about money? It, does he have some micro penis? Is he a good like, person? Is he terrible in yeah. bed? Like, there's all these things she has to find out. Some of those questions are answered when the beautiful woman introduces you to that guy. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. So for instance, coffee and cleavage. I love coffee and cleavage. I'm not dating coffee and cleavage. Chantel and Lenny are my friends. They're my teammates. If I ask, if I told Chantel and Lenny, hey guys, I like that girl. Can you guys help me out? They would love to fucking help me out because they're my teammates. This is so mm. hard. Pickup guys can't, red pill guys can't grasp this whole idea. And e here's the crazy part. Even if Lenny and Chantel introduced me to a girl who's like the woman of my dreams and me and her go home together. Red pill guys still think I'm a bitch because I'm friends with women. This is the part that's so good. You cool. actually like, get that critique and whatnot? That's I'll, I'll I literally show you these critiques, bro. It did like, if I, if I run an eight figure company and go home with the most beautiful woman in the world because I have female friends, I'm still a cuck because I have female <laughs> friends. Like that's it's like, literally, like literally like <laughs> cut your, like literally shoot yourself in the foot, like cut your own dick off rather than just admit. It's just so insane. Burn the whole forest down for no reason it's like their mentality because it's a dogma whereas like rich cooper and rollo tomasi they would not be mad at me for having female friends they would be like well that's kind of unusual or you're an exception michael that's what rollo says red pill guys hardcore red pill guys some of them were like literally angry at me like you have you have broken red pill dynamics and you therefore you in. should be punished <laughs> because you have female friends it doesn't matter that you that they all want to go home with you it just you like it's so crazy it's like hey don't you believe in pre-selection yes how do you get pre-selection yeah be with women. But be, it's so, the logic is so ridiculous and circular. Yes, of course. So it's, it's very hard for people to deal with. Anyway, going back to what I was saying before, anyway, the, the reason why people think that is because they can't d differentiate friend zone from teammate. They think they're the oh, same thing. Oh, yes, good point. Because every woman that they've interacted with that they liked, put them in the friend zone, they don't know there, there's another option. Yeah, it's like there's a PTSD, a, trauma, yeah, yeah, angle. There, there's the friend zone option, which is the only thing you're aware of, but there's also another option called teammate, but you didn't know that teammate existed, so therefore you think that I'm a, <laughs> I'm a fucking loser. That's, that's essentially <laughs> what happened. Thank you, by the way. Your comments are fantastic, and they drive up the algorithm and keep calling me a cuck. Thank you. Okay, let's keep going. <laughs> so let's talk about this. The baseball, and then you end up working in sports. This is fascinating to me. Yes, I played college. 
college baseball at Catawba College, okay. Division Two, North Carolina. They were a really good program. I played with guys who got drafted. So yeah. Division Two baseball is really strong. Yeah. So I, my whole dream, my whole life was to play professional. I get to college. These guys are better than me. Yeah. It's like one of those moments you're like, yeah, yeah, he's bigger, stronger, faster, just better. Yeah. I played for a year and then I transferred to Georgia Southern University, which is where I graduated. And then I was a sport management degree. And then I through various is jobs in and internships. Valdosta? Where's, where's Georgia Southern? Georgia Southern's in Statesboro. Okay, got So it. it's uh, southeast, about 30 miles west of Savannah. Okay. Yep, not got quite it. as south as Valdosta. Okay, got it. Yeah, that but was great it. school. And that school, and I, so funny enough, I was looking on Facebook, like when I was at the small schools, 1200 Catawba College. It was a cool school if you like small schools outside Charlotte. And there was, in North Carolina, man, there's a lot of party schools within driving distance. So great, great place to go to school. But anyway, I looked at my friends at Georgia Southern and I had a moment. I feel like I've always been pretty mature for my age. Yeah. And I realized, I said, this is my only time in college. I saw my friends partying. Yeah. They were you know, out with cute girls sure. and they were partying and going to bars and they had this cool social life. And I knew it was, I wanted to, I never wanted to be the guy who left college and still went back. The guy who's 28 yeah, and like still going sure. to the college frat parties the only, with all the college that's kids. That's the only leverage they had. Yeah. yeah and, they, and they never really grew out of it. So I wanted to enjoy college in the moment. And then when I moved on, I'm done with college. Like I never want to go back. And so I wanted to go fulfill that like party. I wanted to have that experience of partying and getting laid and going out to the bars and night scene and all that stuff. And, and so I transferred, didn't play baseball at Georgia Southern, threw a bunch of huge parties and uh, had a really good college career there. It's funny when you say 1200, I have a buddy of mine who's going to Harvard. He's like, we have 5,000 uh, people undergrad or whatever. Yeah, undergrad, and you're a big graduate, city too. Graduate. I went to UT Austin. My freshman year oh. was 52,800 students. Massive. We put 100,000 people at the uh, Joe Jamal Field. Yep. Uh, for, where, no, it wasn't later until after I left. They put on a, another part of it, over 100,000 at their schools. Yep. I was literally, I would walk to school and there would be thousands of students around. And everywhere. you have a city. You have like the actual city yeah, too. The city of Austin. Statesboro, yeah. Georgia was really small. So yeah. on, on uh, like Christmas break and when the school was out, it, yeah. the city was nothing. That's crazy. That's great. All right. So then you start working in sports management. So this was, this was like a transition for you. Like, how can I still do this sports thing without yep. falling out? I was a huge sports fan my whole okay. life. I am like an encyclopedia. It's actually kind of twisted. Like the other day, dude, it was nuts. I met someone who was like, I, I played football at this school in 2012. I was like, oh, is your coach so-and-so? And this is like a small school. Yeah. It's like bizarre. Uh, but anyway, I was a huge sports fan and wanted to stay in sports. And at the time, I was so directionless. Yeah. I didn't know like business. I didn't know how to yeah. even, what a job. I don't know. I didn't feel prepared. So I stuck in sports. I got an internship with Florida State University, Birmingham Barons after Florida State. Yeah, that's where, that's where Michael Jordan played. He was, he was the Birmingham Barons, he correct. Was a, uh, pitcher for the Birmingham Barons. Outfielder. Yeah. Outfielder, okay. Yes, outfielder. Uh, yes, yeah, so I interned with Florida State, then Birmingham Barons, and then I got a job in Houston. And funny enough, what drove me was pickup. Because yeah. at this time, all that mattered was pickup. And so when I was at Florida State, I was going out to the bars, and it was cool to have this little, like, you know, a better social life. So I could go to go out and, like, practice this pickup thing that I'm learning about. But then I went to Birmingham, and I'm like, oh, this is dead. i got to be in a big city. Do you remember Escobar in, in Houston? And do you remember Bond? There's some of those bars in Houston. What, yeah. what part? We didn't uh, go there. I don't remember. Oh, you didn't go oh, okay. there? Okay, we didn't go there. This no. would have been 2013, 2014. Okay. Yeah. We went mostly midtown. Okay, yeah. But anyway, no, I uh, needed to get to a big city. And when I got there, like, my life changed forever. Because it was way better seen for practicing pickup. And at that time, I was, whatever I could do to get to Las Vegas. I was like, I, that's the, the mecca. Because when you're focused on pickup, there's no better city in the world than Las Vegas. So it's fo so funny. If you want to get good at it, there's no better city. Correct. A bunch Correct. of the guys who like don't, like they come here, they can't handle it and they leave. It's hard. It's very, very hard. You here. said, I think in a recent podcast, like most people don't understand that, dude, the DJs don't come on until two. Yeah. So if you're playing this one. game where you want to pull, yeah, one or two then you're going to be staying out late at it, night. It's so funny when, when I tell people they come here, I was like, oh, I want to see Tiesto. You're excited. Okay, well, he comes on at 1. And they like they want me to tell them, no, I'm going to make him come on at 11.45. <laughs> no, he's coming on at 1. Yeah. Next year, when he plays again, he'll come on at 1. And the year after that, he'll come on at 1. Yeah. DJs in Vegas come on at 1. No matter what time you go to bed, they come on at 1 a.m. and they play till 3. And people are just like, oh, no, it can't be like that. Yes, that's how it is here. Uh, the other thing is, there's two Vegases, right? During the weekend, there's a bunch of tourists. Tourists look like tourists. They look like average American people. They're slightly overweight. They're not exceptionally you know, good looking and not a lot of them are rich and they don't know how to dress. During the weekdays, the, the nightclubs here are full of the most beautiful women I've ever seen in my entire life because they live here. There's no, one of the things about Vegas is there's no middle class here. There's just beautiful women 
and beautiful women. That's it. You can't work even at a reception. You're not even a receptionist at a real estate agent or, uh, or, or a plastic surgeon unless you're gorgeous here. Yeah. If you go to the gyms it's here. good looking city. If you go to the gyms here, every woman here is in shape because it's Las Vegas. It's just so competitive. There's no like normal girls here. Like Only every, place better was certain parts of LA, like the Beverly Hills. Yeah, where certain you feel, parts of LA. You yes. feel like, oh man, I'm, I don't fit in here. Yeah. These people are beautiful. Orange, <laughs> certain places in Orange County is like that too. Yeah, for sure. That's why, that's why I liked it here because, because I would go out on a Tuesday and I would just hang out with some girls that were getting paid to do atmosphere modeling and then we would go have breakfast and they were like more beautiful than anyone I'd ever seen in my entire life and they're just like bored on a Tuesday doing an atmosphere modeling gig getting paid 300 to sit at a table for an hour and I was like I love this are you serious I don't have to go on dates I just go out on Tuesday who's working hey what's going on let's go eat and they're like fuck yeah let's go and it's so oh my god this I was I fell in love with the place after like one week Interesting. Yeah, yeah that's a great city. Yeah. So you 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 were working in sports. You were yep. you were part of that whole. I, I remember very well when um, when uh, Dwight Howard went to Houston and yes. was playing with uh, when, James Harden. One of the one of the biggest. Yeah. One of the most important parts of my life was when I went to Houston to work for the Rockets, and Dwight Howard. Like within a month, I was in sales selling season tickets, and Dwight Howard agreed to go from the Lakers to the Rockets. Mm -hmm. And they had had a playoff team before with James Harden. Chandler Parsons was an up and coming player. Yeah. And when they added Dwight Howard, it was nuts. Could you could you tell it wasn't going to work? I know we're getting into some sports. No, stuff. no, no, not at all. I, I, I thought it, it would. I knew immediately it wasn't going to work. Really? Oh, you're also blinded, dude, because yeah. I was so incentivized when people wanted to come to the events and they buy tickets and I make commission. Yeah, it was. it's really funny watching Dwight his whole career because uh, I was a fan of Dwight Howard. The problem, like he's a perfect five for today, but back then right. when, when he went there, it's like, He's this five who can't score, who thinks he can. So he caused, it's a very much like, um, what's his name? Kyle Lowry. Kyle Lowry thinks he's way better than he actually is, who gets his team in a lot of trouble. It's, uh, another example would be like, uh, I'm trying to think, like Kirk Cousins was another great example. Like they, they think they're better players than they are, so they get their teams in deep shit. And that was, I was watching the whole thing, and I was like, this is not going to work because James Harden needs space under the basket. Dwight Howard can't go anywhere else. He has to stay in the lane. Right. So he's going to fuck this up for Harden. Harden, like watch, when, when, Howard's off the floor. They're going to score more points. And that's essentially what happened, right? Yeah. And then Chandler Parsons, I was like, this guy can't guard anyone. I don't really think he's going to play very well. When he got to Dallas, he was just useless. Yeah. He was yeah. a shell of himself. He was a nice you know? player. Yeah. Yeah, he, was, he could definitely could score. He could, yeah. he could fill it out. Um, so now here's the thing. Now you're doing this where the two things here, you started, was the real estate first or going after the fake gurus? Which was first? Real estate. Okay. I was interested in real estate. So I was in Oakland before Las Vegas. Okay. I was working for the Oakland A's and okay. I made a career change into computer programming, which I loved. And in Oakland, you don't buy real estate. I was making 33600 a year. And in Oakland, you can do the math. You, yeah. you aren't buying anything. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I like the idea of owning real estate. And I was still new to the, the concept of investing. And so I moved to Vegas and I look around and go, okay, here's my salary. Here's the expenses. I do some calculations and like, it might be possible to own real estate. Yeah. And I also met at the same time, I met a really nice guy at the gym who's like, yeah, bro, I bought a house and I rent to my friends and here's my mortgage payment and here's what they pay me. And I go, wait a second, you're living for free and you own an asset, you're making money on the house. How do I do that? And so that's when the concept of house hacking came. Yes. So I bought a condo in Las Vegas Country Club, which I'm assuming you're familiar with yeah. right by the strip. Great area. I bought a condo in there, 120,000 September 2016, rented the other so room. So the condo in the high rise up there, that's no, right there? No, so that's Turnberry okay. that I think you're thinking of. Okay. Right? There, yeah. is, there is one building in the Country Club, right? One tall building in the Country Club? Yes. It's yeah. not that area. Okay. So there's Monterey condos yeah. are the whole condo community. Okay. I bought in there. 120,000 was a great buy. Two bed, two bath, 1,200 square feet. And so I was able to pay... Uh, 880 a month was the total HOA, everything 880. And I got 700 a month from my roommate. So I was like, wow. Oh, this is pretty cool. And so I do that. And then that's when real estate started kicking off and I started loving this idea of real estate and I wanted to look at, to get my second property. And so that's when I started going to meetups and really d diving deep into real estate. That's awesome. So that's what house hacking is. It's like yes. you're modulizing different parts of the house. To, yep. And then that. And this is what I do. So yep. I'm, I'm very open about it. So, and I love very much talk passionately about it because yeah. I think it's the best way for a lot of young men to start investing and start yeah. uh, making some extra money. And the concept is essentially buying a house, renting out the spare rooms. And the theory is that with the income earned from the other rooms, you will live for free. Yeah. And so you've seen here in Vegas, man, rent is going up. So let's say someone's living for a thousand a month. If they're cool living with roommates, you can buy a house in that a thousand dollars a month now goes uh, to zero because you bought a house and you're renting to roommates. I've had coaching live-in programs that were very similar. It's actually, yes. I got more than what we're, we're Yeah, I mean, imagine, yeah. Uh, th this wouldn't apply to you, but imagine if you rented a mansion and some of your coaching clients would come and pay 3000 a week to come stay with you. People would buy and you would have you know, each room through, uh, it gets nuts, man. 38, can, 28 Topaz uh, on, uh, on the east side of Las Vegas. 
That's what we did. Was that Project Hollywood back in the day? Project, no. Or pro- sorry, Project Vegas, sorry. Project uh, Vegas, man. Yeah. Yep, lived there. It was 3830, 3830 Topaz. This was the RSD product, right? No, it nothing to do with RSD. Oh. It was just, uh, me and some, some other partners, we lived there, and we had 10 clients living with us for free. Not, no, we were living for free, but the right. clients were all paying to get there, and we would like... Oh, you were on come. Topaz? Mm-hmm. I think that's right down the street from... Oh, is that Eastern and Russell? Yeah, like, it's kind of yeah, there. That's where my old house was. There was the a, there have. was a, we had a hot tub and it was like an old beat up, like nineties mansion built in the nineties yeah. and we would have speeches there and it was, it was a fun time, but it's we were a living cool for free. business though, where you get a mansion and you have, anyway, so house hacking can be anything, yeah. but what I focus on is uh, buying five or six bed houses. The one I'm under contract on right now is a five bed house. I got a huge upstairs living room uh, in the Southwest area. You have Pulte Homes, American West, the builder, mm. their model is perfect for what I do. So anyway, it's, it's what I preach because I, I know a lot of men out there are, they feel a little directionless and maybe they don't have what it takes to start a business, but they want to start investing or how do you, how do you make money, Spencer? Well, I think house hacking is the best way for a lot of young men to, to get started. I love having roommates. I know it's weird. It's cool. it's, it's, it, I'm a 45 year old man and I make a really good living. I shouldn't want to have roommates. I love having roommates. If you, in your situation, if you could find people that add value to your life, yeah. it's amazing. I, I, well, my, some of my sales team, I would let them live with me yeah. and they would, they would sit there and be on sales calls and then out of nowhere, like, do imagine this, okay? Someone's in my, I, I built a studio in my den. The, my sales guys will use it for a sales call. In the middle of the sales call, they're having some trouble, and the guy's like, hey, let me call Michael over here. And it was like, oh, Michael happens to be here in the office. And I'll come and sit in there, and we'll close a $15,000 deal because I'm, I happen to be sitting there. Of course I want this guy to fucking live with me. Are you kidding me? Oh, yeah. That was great. Like, and I you lo- have a little more control in the sense of, you can monitor, you can manage them really well. Of course, I got, I listen, cause I, it's hard for me cause sales is not my main thing. We have, I have a sales team, but listening to my sales guys go through their calls every day actually helped me understand how the pro, the program was sold. And also one of the things I made sure was, and your videos were a great re- reason for this. We never promise shit that didn't happen or we Good. can't pull, we can't fulfill, right? We say, this is the thing that you're going to have to do and it's going to be hard. I love and it. those are, that's all true, right? First three steps in my program, one, fix your Instagram, two, build a list of all the people you want to network with, a couple thousand people, and then three, we need to, we, you need to have the skill set to take six females to a, someone else's event. Oh. That's, the, that's step three in my program. You do those first three things. I'm not promising you anything, but I do will tell you this, if you are able to do those first three things, your life is going to change. For sure. From then on, now I have a foundation to now we can build and take you in different directions. You can start throwing your own events. You can start doing all, you can start throwing, you know, real estate events or meeting mortgage brokers. There's a million different things that you can do based on that. Yep. So the fake gurus thing, what, what happened there? Was the, Robert Kiyosaki, was that the first one? No, Dan Locke. So Dan Locke. I, I started flipping houses in Cincinnati, Ohio, okay. and they went sideways. I ended up losing 90 grand for a guy making 45K a year. I mm. lost 90 grand. Yeah, you do the math. It was a very, very difficult time in my life. And I was, uh, I didn't have any money to go out at this time. I had to sell my car. I was riding the bus four hours a day to and from work. And at night I was, I was watching YouTube and I was, I had been making videos, but I wanted to, uh, I wanted to start a new, a new kind of a pivot. And I saw this guy, Coffeezilla when it was like a Friday night. I still remember it. And it was like fake guru Friday. I was like, Oh, this is interesting. I watched a video and then I watched a second and then a third and I was like fake guru that's a term I hadn't thought of and I thought it was really interesting and so my what I set out to do is I wanted to give an objective look I feel like I'm a pretty objective person I'm very fair and so my 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 belief was that some of these guys were not who they said they were but I wanted to give a very fair look and so I started with Dan Locke who at the time was very popular and uh, I just happened to catch niche right when it was catching on fire but yeah I started making videos December 2nd, 2019 was the first time I released. Wow. Uh, I had a series called Authentic or Charlatan, which is where I wanted to evaluate a guru and figure out if they were authentic or more of a charlatan. And right away, I could see that the views were there. It's this cross section where it's like you're doing good work, but there is a level of negativity to it that like spikes yes. on social media. Yeah, yeah. And I, I totally get any criticism. It's totally cool. I don't ever want to be like the negative guy. I feel like I'm providing a service. I feel like I'm fair to people. I feel like what I'm doing is is not being a hater. I know you alluded to it with like the Mickey Mays well, 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 it's not just that. It's like Philon. Like he just, yes. he rubs me the Philion. wrong way. Yeah. Well, or Philion, sorry. Well, he rubs me the wrong way where it's like, it's clear that you get energy from mm. hurting this person. And the other thing is like the stuff he says about Bulzerian. So, so, so much of it I know. So here's the thing. Do I know where all of his money came from? No, I can tell you objectively he made $44 million betting with Alec Gores. Not only have I seen the actual receipts, the, the wire transfers, I have seen the text message thread between he and Alec Gores, the guy who runs all those SPACs. I've seen them with my own eyes. He said, you lost $44 million to me. And Alec Gores says, yes, let's play again in... Uh, Vegas. They were going to play in Vegas, like head up for a million dollars. Okay. I also know unequivocally he won $10 million gambling with Sam Majid. 
and all the that's why the whole Doug Polk thing happened. I was like, dude, Doug Polk is about to get his ass handed to him because I don't know where all the money came from. I do know that he didn't have any of the, the hedge fund money until after his 35th birthday. And the other problem is like his father expatriated to St. Kitts. So the SEC wasn't like unaware of what uh, uh, his dad was doing. Gordon Gecko in Wall Street, the movie, is it was created after Dan Bilzerian's fucking father. That's who they created the character after. Yes. So they knew who he was. This idea that all of a sudden this guy, like America's most wanted guy, is going to be able to siphon hundreds of millions of dollars off to his son out in the open, it's just hard to believe. Now, here's the thing. If it is true, what, what is Dan going to do? He's not going to tell on his dad. Right. So he's kind of like in this weird situation. What I do know is this. If Dan was a trust fund kid, he would have no problem telling you. He, does, he, says all, he says money spends all the same. He tells a story about shoving steroids up his asshole to walk across the Mexican border to, sh to take the steroids with him to use it while he was in SEAL training. His book was really good, by the way. Yeah. But, but, I, I couldn't put it down. But it, he talks about people filming him while he was masturbating when he was 12 years old, wanting to kick his ass. And you think he's embarrassed about being a trust fund kid? Yeah. No. If there was any conflict, it may be for, on his father's sake. But not on Dan's sake. Dan doesn't give a shit. Mm -hmm. Bro, he talks about, like all he openly talks about being embarrassed by Lauren Blake and fucking Sophia Beverly, falling in love with them and then falling out of love, like realizing it wasn't what, what he wanted. And uh, several other girls. You know, it, I have a hard time believing that that was the whole situation with Dan. It was like when when I read the book, you know, what I was worried about it was it was gonna be me, 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 narcissist. And it wasn't like that at all. It was mm -hmm. like, here's all the embarrassing shit I did. Here is the view that I have on life, and this is why this worked for me. And it wouldn't there's another reality where Dan loses all that money. He's very open about that. There's another reality where a good chunk of my change is gone. He talked about I would have joined the military again. So like that was my backup plan to join the military. There's another there's another reality where Vegas Dave admits he's like I could have lost. There was a six hundred thousand dollar bet. He, have you do you see the interview I did with him where he's like I'm in uh, 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 Gamblers Anonymous. While yeah. I was at Gamblers yeah. Anonymous, I have this fucking epiphany. I'm like no. Fuck these people. They're losers. And he drives off in his fucking sports car to yeah. go make a $600,000 bet. That's so and, funny. And then Dan, he comes to me. He goes, hey, man, I want to make a Netflix special. And I was like, Dave, here's the problem. The Netflix special, in the end, you're supposed to learn a lesson. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Unless it's Rick and Morty. Yeah, to, to complete the circle. There, there needs to be a complete, even yep. the game by Neil Strauss. He finds right. one woman right. and falls in love. Which, by the way, no, that's true. But he... Hmm. The, it, the, he, that's what happens. He completes the circle. In the end, the protagonist learns a lesson and grows as a human. But Vegas Dave was like, I gambled and lost a bunch of money, and the lesson I learned was to gamble more. That's not the le – like, Dave, they're not going to make a Netflix special on you, bro. That's not going to how it's work. So he ended up making his own movie. But I remember telling him that. I was like, bro, I don't think this is going to work the way you think it is. The same thing with uh, the reality show. I just had um, Alexandra Rose on here from Selling the OC, which I thought you, you might find some of those, those TV shows interesting. Mm -hmm. And at the very end of the show, it's just nothing but fucking chaos and bitterness and fucking pettiness. And I was like – and I remember looking at Alexander and I was like, there's no growth. Like nobody learned a lesson. <laughs> nobody became better. And at the very end, she ends up making a $20 million sale and just waving her dick at everybody else in the room. Wow. It's like, fuck you guys. We win. And I'm like, this is the growth. There's no, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, it's at the end drama of, for drama. At the sake. end of Romeo and Juliet, you learn a lesson. There's some growth. There's no growth. There's no, <laughs> it was so funny. It was like, at the end of the show, they all hate each other. And then the people they hate the most have the biggest sale and they're ringing a bell. And then the fucking <laughs> season's over that's amazing makes uh, you want more though yeah, it does it makes me it makes well you want done more. by the producers oh my god it was so fucking funny all right here's the other thing i want to talk about so i've i've heard about this i know people buy blue check marks and i know people buy followers but i don't know how and you went into some depth about that can you go over how in general and then specifically that whole musical artist trick yeah, that they run. funny enough i didn't even tell you this by the way yeah. the video i'm working on now my next video is going to be about the scandal oh which one the blue checkmark scandal oh, that came out of ProPublica. It's a pretty fascinating game. And I don't I don't think anything's done shady. Mm -hmm. I see Instagram as a game uh -huh. and people are just trying to beat the game. I don't see anything wrong with that. So you're trying to get a blue check mark. Yeah. Look, you're you're trying to get the blue check mark because for whatever reason. So essentially what they did is there was an agency, Adam Quinn and this guy Dylan Shamoon. Yeah, you, I know came about together. Adam, yeah. Oh, do you yeah. You know Adam lost his account because he was openly he was open, like so. Instagram stance is you can't buy a blue check mark. Right. Adam Quinn goes. Uh, not only is it not true, Adam Quinn. I know people who he's gotten blue check marks for. Adam Quinn apparently goes on his Instagram and is is advertising that he can get you a blue check mark oh. on Instagram. And then I think that's, that's how no he lost. I heard that's how he lost his account. Yeah, I've been told that they kind of had a falling out, and one of them wanted to screw the other. Anyway, okay. but essentially what they did is they figured out that going on Spotify, 
you could get verified on Spotify and that would make you a musical artist. Oh. So then they would go on Google and they would, they would have a bunch of fake articles that you are an artist and they would use certain buzzwords and all this stuff. So then Google would create a panel because whenever someone Googles your name, the first 10 things that come up are all these articles about you being a mu musician. So now Google labels you as a musician. So then when you went to apply for Instagram verification, you're a musician and on your Instagram bio, you put musician and here's my album coming out. And it was just a, a loophole. That's all it was. And insane. It's nuts. So they have like these plastic surgeons that have these articles about being a musical, a musical artist. artist and his new album coming out. And what's crazy is if you go on their Spotify's, it's all just melodic loops. Yeah. There is no actual song. It's just a song from Fiverr. That's insanity. And it's the same. A lot of them use the same songs throughout is this their the, clients. Is this the only way you see them getting the blue check marks? No, there's various ways. So the, the Instagram game has always been uh, a, a fight between Instagram to hold this really, really, really valuable, arguably the most valuable thing on social media right now, this blue check mark, and then people trying to beat the system. Yeah. And so it, initially it was, oh, I've been on a TV show or something, you know, something like I was in a news article once. Okay, yep, you're verified. So then, okay, they tighten it up a little bit. Now you need certain news articles. So you get Forbes and Entrepreneur. So now you need three of those to get verified. Well, then they've tightened that up. And now you had to do this whole loophole of being a musical artist. Well, they're going to tighten that up. And now I've been told, I have a friend that runs an agency that helps people get blue checks. And um, they've said it's essentially for entrepreneurs, it's essentially impossible at this point. Isn't that crazy? Alex Hormozzi is a guy who lives out here who's as legit as anyone. And it's taken them 11 months to get him a blue check. Did he got one? No, I, I don't think so. He still has maybe, one. Maybe he does. I, uh, last so, I heard it, he does not. So here's what's crazy. So uh, the, U, the, it's the UK Daily Star writes an article on my podcast every week. I did not know about this. Somebody showed it to me. Every week there's an article and they source me in it. So I send it to Instagram. I'm like, every week they're writing an article. And then I saw it was, um, there's two bodybuilder magazines that wrote articles on my podcast, like all this stuff. They're like, well, you're not the main source. Of, you're not the main feature of the podcast. So we're not going to feed, we're not going to do blue check marks. I'm like, oh, okay, that's fine, whatever. Then I showed them there are 20 fake accounts of me where guys are literally telling women, Oh, because I, I recruit women for bikini competitions. Oh. So now they're getting women to show up to places in real life using my face. Oh, no. And Instagram still doesn't want to verify me, but even after that. And I'm like, like this is a legitimate safety issue, and they don't want to do it. And then I see guys who are like convicted pimps who like fucking beat the shit yeah. out of a bunch of women, and they have a blue check mark. And I'm like, wow, that's amazing that this is how you choose to use your verification in this case. And now this whole situation, like, I, I, I do, the fact that there's a guy in, Turkey who can get your account back. Have you heard this? Like, oh, that's a whole nother scheme. So there was, there was a, th yeah. this definitely has happened before where people will ban you. They'll yeah. get your account taken down and then they'll offer you to unban Thank it. Thank you. Thank you. You know how many people are, nuts. there are people watching this right now that did not know this. There's a one guy, oh, I know, and like he's like, he's in Turkey and he like, uh, get your account back. He's the one who got your account taken down in the first place. It's and they very don't easy. It. If you're not, if you don't have a blue check, it's very easy to get your account taken down. I dealt with this. Thank the Lord that I made a video about this mm -hmm. and someone, an employee at Facebook likes my content and reached out on LinkedIn and said, Hey, I got you. So they put a flag on my account yeah. such that it won't get taken down again, but it happened three times. Yeah. I have a friend at Meta who, who did something similar. And you, so that. that's always the trick is you have to have an employee. That's how all these little systems work is you yeah. had to have a rogue, not, mine's not a rogue employee, but in the verification game, they always had to have a rogue employee that would charge. Yeah, no, he, he doesn't charge me anything. It was just a situation where he saw that I had 20 fake accounts and I told him, I was straight up, I was like, hey, dude, you understand? I showed him messages. They're, they're fucking messaging girls to come to different events using my face. That's scary it as is. fuck, bro. This is sexual assault, human trafficking that you're allowing because you're not letting them verify it's me. Some of the accounts had more followers than I had. Yep, the fake it's all accounts. paid for. It's madness, It's super bro. annoying. I, I've dealt with it. Mine are just crypto scams. And so a girl I used to sleep with actually uh, fell for 3000 That's crazy. Sent them 3000 bucks. Man, I felt, I felt like such dog shit, too. Uh, on, this, on this podcast, we say Bible study. We don't sleep with anyone. Oh. We don't. I'm just kidding. No, whatever. <laughs> okay. Say whatever you want. I'm kidding. <laughs> I had Bible study with her. <laughs> I had Bible study. That's awesome. Uh, okay, so that, that's the, so. There's are there any other ways to get the blue check mark? It's just you said for entrepreneurs, it's difficult because they're not it's like nearly impossible. they're not famous. I think what happened is you had a lot of the fake gurus just abuse the system. Yeah, and that's they what figured happened. out. And also, like, what is the purpose of verification? Is really was fame. Like, yeah. you're legitimately famous. This is really Drake's account, and yeah. uh, now you have so many fake gurus that have a, a little e-commerce store, and yeah. they fuck blue check mark. Like what? all these little shitheads with five K, dude. I have a funny story. My my buddy who runs the agency, one of his employees was one of these little e-com kids who had a good year, started selling a course and got a blue check mark, but he was still working for him because he knew he actually didn't make shit. Yeah, it's crazy. But he had a blue check mark. It's, uh, it's, it's disappointing how valuable it is and how meaningful it is, 
and yet people can game the system. And yeah. then me and you, I deal with it too. Me and you deal with the, the fallout of all the fake accounts. And they, what they really need is they just need to add a green check mark. Green is for all the Uber celebrities, the, the Drakes yeah. and the, yeah. the real people. Just add a green. They have green, yeah. verified, organic. You can't game the system. Internal employee has to do it. And then you leave the blue for people like me and you. It's like, it's really us, yeah. but we're not quite... You know, super treat, treat it like the Hall of Fame. You have a certain. You only put seven Hall of Famers in per year. Like there's a yeah. certain number yes. of yes. per month. Only a certain number of green check marks yes. that can be accepted per month. I think you, you did solve this right away. It wouldn't be a problem. All right, let's talk about this. So I, uh, you know, full disclosure, I do know Andrew. Uh, we've been texting back and forth. You made the H three video. Yeah. I became very angry when I was watching that video. Uh, it's because upsetting. Remember, I don't agree with everything Andrew says, but like watching that video, I was very upset when he again. Just because you're losing, like if you want to beat someone, beat them in the air arena of ideas. There is no, let me say this right now, I don't care how fucking mad you get, and I watch YouTube try to take this video down. Andrew Tate has never been charged with human trafficking. One more time, Andrew Tate has never been charged with human trafficking. There's videos of a girl going out that, that was supposedly trafficked, grabbing a pizza, walking back into the house. The police came to the house because her boyfriend was fig trying to figure out why this girl was at Andrew and, and Tristan Tate's house. According to Andrew and Tristan, she was hooking up with Tristan. The guy freaked out, called the, the embassy. The embassy sends the police over to the house. They go over to the house. No one is arrested. They go in for questioning because basically what this other guy did was a crime. He swatted them. Yeah. Go in for questioning. They come out. They are charged with nothing. Then there's the other video where he uh, slaps that girl. She comes out very clearly says, this was a game we were playing. I was, and I've talked about this before. Some of the stuff women ask me to do in private, if you guys walked in on me, you would call the police. They are asking me to do this. It's completely consensual. She admits that what happened there was consensual. You saw several uh, you know, uh, con content creators. I love you, Nicole Arbor, but Nicole Arbor did this. She fucking posted that video of Andrew Tate. The girl comes out and says this was consensual. She takes that video. She has to take the video down. I, I don't mind if you disagree with what he says about women not being able to drive. I don't mind if you disagree with about women being property. I because I agree with you on that. Don't call him a fucking human trafficker if you have no proof in this. And and just like with the thing with um, uh, Alex Jones saying that the the people of Sandy Hook that whole thing was fake. Yeah. You have the right to say that, then they have the right to sue you. Absolutely, that's the way it works. There are repercussions. Yeah. I I'm in the same boat. I think there's some things I understand. Andrew Tate. I think he's a guy who he's very intelligent even though people are like he's a dummy Dude, he's in wildly intelligent yes he's the issue with andrew tate is he knows that when he goes to the extreme he gets all the attention which he seems like a little on the attention horse side he kind of knows how to play the game when he tries to make a point instead of making it five out of ten yeah. he goes to the ten out of ten extreme and i think that's where a lot of people have issues all women are lazy when he yeah, says stuff like that of, instead yeah. of adding in the nuance which i know he's intelligent enough to yeah. add in so anyway um but i don't like this game of of calling him things that he's not. And that's what it's H3 did. Very H3, dangerous H3 game. straight up said he's a human trafficker and then repeated it over and over Dude, again. Do you, know the do you know what that really means yes. to be a sex trafficker? Yeah. That means you are taking a young woman who's vulnerable, you are doing things to her against her consent, and then sending her to someone who is against her consent going to yeah. do certain things to her body. Like that is a heinous crime. Yeah. And I want to I want to hold it true that if someone is doing that and someone calls it out, all the alarm bells are going off. But we're getting to a point on social media where people are just saying all these criminal things about each other. That I want to hold that near and dear. Like if, if you make a claim like someone is committing fraud or someone is doing certain things to women, that the authorities are alerted immediately because these words matter. But when you have someone that's just sitting there like, oh, he's, a, he's like, yeah, he's, a, he's grooming all these young kids yeah. on the bus, like the clip from my video. Yeah. I was like, man, this is kind of disturbing. And so, also, I don't want to live in a world where you, you, have, you, you have no pursuit of truth. That's another part that doesn't necessarily matter in court, but he's shown a, a willingness to go against what he believes to be the truth. Yeah. He's shown no interest in pursuing so, the truth. So, and you said before, you like H3. And yeah, they're was, cool. The, I, I like yeah. what they do. I am in favor of criticism. I yeah. think it's healthy. I think un, uh, 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 social media without criticism lets all these people run rampant. Yeah. And all the people who are buying into these like fake guru schemes and the fraudulent investment schemes, you have a lot of victims, right? And so I like providing criticism. I like that I can have a voice. CoffeeZilla can have a voice. H3 can criticize people. But there is certainly a line. I am confident I've never crossed the line. I felt like I've always respected. I don't respected. think you have. That's why yeah. I wanted you on here. I I've always respected people. Even when I like add in some entertainment and clown on people, like, okay, it's, you can tell it's jokes. And I think they're warranted. But anyway, but then once you start going into like grooming young children, he has an orphan just to groom young children. I was like, man, that's, that's pretty ugly. One thing I didn't add to that video that I find really interesting is that he has been presented with a cease and desist, being notified by Andrew's legal team yeah. that what he is saying is defamatory and untrue. 
and the fact that he was mocking it, and if he continues to say these things, he, it, the burden of proof is now actually, now actually on him. He has to now say, you were presented with evidence that it is not true. Yeah. You that's, I now that, have that, to present the, it that's, that, that's how defamation works. Right. That's why like, I've had certain people like try to sue me for defamation, and I'm like, hey, you understand? We get to look in your books too, bitch. Yes, you understand? We get to discover what's going on with you, and then all of a sudden, nothing. I hear nothing from them. Like, you actually, you forget about the part where what I'm saying is true. That's the, right. you know what I'm saying? Right. That, you know, the, your narcissistic beliefs. But this is why we, uh, when I had uh, Jamie Lynn on here, and Jamie, uh, she's a, a marriage and family therapist, we were discussing about whether or not Amber Heard is a narcissist or a psychopath. And we believe she's not a psychopath because if she was a psychopath, she would have never let me get it to trial. A narcissist, she believes she's right. Of course I shit in his bed. He's a terrible person. I des he deserved for me to shit in his bed. Obviously that is normal behavior for me. Obviously only a narcissist would believe that. Would it make sense? Of course I hit... Uh, I punched him and made up lies about him punching me. Of course I did, because he's my boyfriend and he hurt me. There's my husband and he hurt me, therefore I deserve to make up these lies. Does that make sense? Yeah. A narcissist would believe that. A psychopath would be like, wow, I shit in this dude's bed. I don't want anyone to find out about this. I'm gonna leave the fucking country. That's what a psychopath would have done. So that's why we believe that she was a narcissist, not a psychopath. Interesting. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Because she's delusional. She's like, There's no way, she got Molly Watt 56 to nothing. There's no way she should have gone to trial. Right. Her defense is, yeah, Johnny, uh, Johnny Depp drinks whiskey in the morning. Who here did not think Johnny Depp drinks whiskey in the morning? Jack Sparrow is an alcoholic. <laughs> and he did Rum Diary. He plays a fucking alcoholic in a Disney movie, yeah. and you didn't realize he drinks whiskey in the morning? No. Yeah, and there were news reports he spends like 100 grand a month on wine or something. <laughs> Johnny Depp does cocaine? Shut the fuck up. I had no idea Johnny Depp does cocaine. Obviously, let's find in favor of Amber Heard. What is wrong with you? Mm -hmm. Like, did you really think we didn't know? The reason why John, we like Johnny Depp is because we know he does cocaine and drinks whiskey. He's, <laughs> he's pretty flawed. fucking, he's flawed. That's why we love him. Mm -hmm. We love his flawed ass. But you know what he did? He didn't hit you. And if he did, what? you better show me that he did. Did Andrew give any indication that he'd sue? Um, well, you said he had the cease and desist. Yeah. Here's the thing with Andrew. Okay, I try to, I love you, Andrew, if you're watching this. I try to bait him into shit all the time where I'm like, because I, I sent, because the girls are always asking, I'm like, hey, do you want to say something to Andrew? And girls will always come on my videos and we'll send videos to Andrew. Andrew never responds. He's always like, hey, good to see you, bro, or like an LOL. Because I know he's, he's smart. He doesn't, what he doesn't want is something to get screenshot. Obviously, I would never screenshot anything against Andrew, but like he doesn't want to do that. So when I ask him the question, the smart thing for him to do is to not respond. Got it. Do I think he will, he's going to respond? If I was him, of course I would. This is a layup fucking case. And also, here's the problem. I don't know if you saw yesterday, uh, YouTube took down a bunch of um, uh, videos about Andrew Tate. On they took mine down. They did. Yeah, I I had one. I I had one where I just jokingly I interviewed him taking yeah, clips out of that. context. It they was took kind, that I down. It was funny. It took it down. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I may have to blank his name out of this one. I don't know. I don't know if that works. Was it because it was in the title? Well, my video about him is Hustlers University of Pyramid Scheme. They didn't take that one okay. down. Okay. All right. His name was in the title. Yeah. Yet. Yeah. So so it's funny they took a bunch of these videos down, and so I mean it's kind of an interesting situation where like now what happens when he's legally being defamed? Why well, are you going to take it? Now we really are getting into First Amendment shit. He's legally being defamed, legally trying to defend himself, and you're not even allowing him to defend himself when he's... Be you understand what I'm yeah. saying? He's being accused of a crime he didn't commit. I think, and one thing that I am super interested to see with this is yeah. I think this is going to be like a precedent-building case. Oh, it's for sure. fascinating because H3, to their defense, they've won a case which helped YouTubers immensely yeah. because they won a defamation case earlier, but this one might... They might create the bounds, the lower bound of what you can't do and then the lower bound or the upper bound of what you can do. And, and how about what these... So first of all, he didn't violate terms of service on Instagram. He violated terms of service on YouTube or... Right. Or, or you could say he violated service terms of service on TikTok, except he wasn't on TikTok. Right. This, is, this, this becomes a weird case because now what do you do with O.J. Simpson? Right. Why does O.J. Simpson have a Twitter account? I think he violated terms of service with the 63 stab wounds, right? He did that off the platform, right? Yeah. But he still has a Twitter. But now we're saying that Andrew Tate did something off the platform, but his account goes away. How does that work? You yeah. see what I'm saying? Very now, interesting case. We're, we're, making, we're, we're, we're throwing flags and calling technical fouls on sports and games that we aren't involved with. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? The NBA can't say that's incredibly horrible what, what this NFL player did. They don't have the jurisdiction to do that. Instagram is now suspending people for things they did on, on other platforms. You see that? Yeah. When Twitter took uh, uh, Donald Trump's account away, Instagram didn't. Oh, interesting. Instagram didn't. And the Instagram still have the account up. So now this thing gets weird. The other part of it is obviously... Uh, the cancel culture doesn't work. It didn't work when the right tried to cancel Colin Kaepernick. He got I a Nike deal. I think it deal. does whenever people allow it to. My belief on the cancel culture. Do you think I, it's? Do you think it's allowed? Do you think it's going to work here? I think people here? allow it. 
Well, I don't, what I'm saying is I think he's more famous now. No, I'm sorry. When I say allow, I mean when, when the person getting canceled allows it. Oh, right? got it. Like there was a Lizzo. I don't really follow this, but there was an example. She had a lyric or something, mm -hmm. and, and people were complaining that one word and one song was wrong to a certain group of people, and she went and changed the song. Oh. Instead of standing up and just saying like, no, creatively, I was in this space. That word means something different to this group of people versus that one. Mm. I'm not going to change anything. But instead, you, like, you back down. You see, comedians, the reason why none of these comedians really get canceled is because they come up and they make jokes about it. And then, it, okay, it doesn't affect them. So all the, like, dude, come on. If you're in cancel culture, like if you're one of these people in cancel culture and you try to cancel someone and they, they, you can tell it doesn't affect them, they just move on. Yeah. How about uh, uh, Snoop Dogg? Did you ever see that interview they did on... Uh this is the funniest, guys, if you if you pause this video and watch this, Snoop Dogg, this woman comes up and he goes, those things that you said about women in your earlier, um, your earlier albums, do you mean, or do you think in the current climate that you would like change some of those words? He goes, nah, I meant every word I said, fuck them hoes. You ever <laughs> see that? He goes, I wear it, meant Perfect every, example. You he goes, I meant every goddamn word, fuck them hoes. He, he said that. I was like, oh my God. Yeah, and it's over. Yeah. All right, no more. No and nobody messes with him yeah, anymore. exactly. I, I think with Joe Rogan, the reason why cancel culture can't quite get to him is because he has long form content. And if you listen to him in context, he does not sound crazy. If you take little snippets, you can make him sound a little off or right wing or left wing. Dude, that whole clip, have you ever seen the one where he's explaining to Candace Owens about uh, uh, climate change? No. You, whatever you think about climate change, you cannot watch that clip and then tell me he's a right wing extremist. He's, explain, he's going step by step and explaining to her why the climate is actually changing and how you can't deny climate change. If you think he's a right wing extremist, watch that video, your brain will melt. He's not a right wing extremist. If you take him in context, he's a normal fucking dude who didn't want to pay state income taxes in California and deal with the masks and all that other shit. So he moved to Texas. That was his choice. He's not weird. There's nothing weird about about. Uh, uh, that's why we all like him. That's why we like Joe Rogan is because he's just like a kind of a common dude. Yeah. You know, he makes mistakes like everybody else, and he owns up to those mistakes sometimes. sometimes One thing that does worry me a little bit, and I hate short form. I yeah. hate TikTok. I make this very clear is this game that some people play where they're taking things way out of context. Yeah. And it's okay. It's okay if you take me out of context and kind of clown on me and call me a loser, or call me goofy. It, it doesn't matter. But when you take something so out of context and you provide a very opinionated view and then that person, the perception of that person is not accurate, I think that's a real problem. Yeah, I mean... You saw this a lot with Tate, of yeah, course. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I mean, I think this is only going to get worse. I don't like it. Because you have to think about it. Those guys were getting an affiliate fee for getting people to sign up, so they needed to get as many views as no, possible. No, no, I'm talking about on the opposite side, when people want to make him look bad. Yeah. You can clip anyone. Right, right. This idea of, like, clip culture. Well, but, but, but it wouldn't even look bad. He would say extreme stuff. Yeah. And they were not trying to make him look bad, but it made him look bad and made people sign up for HU. That, oh, was, the, yeah. that, was, that was the issue that was happening. Yeah, that's like uh, a funny part of social media. Is I, yeah, I have one uh, with Andrew Tate or, or Justin Waller talking about Andrew Tate on YouTube that just got uh, 800,000 views uh, yesterday. And uh, it got, I think it were six, 700,000, something like that. It's just Justin Waller talking about Andrew Tate. And it was, it was interesting how the whole thing works. It's like, this is, what, this is the point I was trying to make. You and I are not dealing with 10 million a month. Right. Okay. You talked about Hustlers University making six and a half million dollars a month. That's what you estimated them making. We're criticizing situations where we, bro, I'm so, I know we all think we have this fucking integrity, but you don't know if you're out there, just, just close your eyes and just think about what you'd be willing to say for six and a half million dollars a month. A month. What would you be willing? Like, I know all of you guys, oh, I can't believe Andrew Tate said this, or even Alex Jones or whoever, or even Donald Trump. What would you be willing, be honest with yourself, just be in a vacuum, close your eyes. What would you be willing to say on the internet for six and a half million a month? Quit. And like, recurring. And recurring. Recurring. Every month. Like, I know a lot your of you are like, no, different. I would never, ever say this stuff. You're flying I'm, private everywhere. Way, I'm not saying that Andrew did it because of that. But what I am saying is you, I'm, and I'm, it's certainly not even an excuse. I'm just saying when these things got a, like, a, a, like out of hand, he's been the nicest, most polite dude I've ever met when I talked to him. And so the, the, it's funny because I wasn't watching the TikTok clips. I didn't know all this crazy stuff he was saying about women are lazy and shouldn't drive. I didn't know. I was just talking to this really fucking nice dude with a British accent who's, you know, who's from Chicago. That's all I was you know, listening to. So it was, it was surprising to me. And then I started thinking, and I'm not, again, not an excuse, but like these people who are criticizing, what would you be willing to say for six and a half million dollars a month? Dude, once I realized that the average American can't tie their shoes. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> it's a different game. Okay, so since that, we, we both agree that is a clear uh, case of defamation. I believe so, yeah. Let's go the opposite direction. Let's talk about that BitBoy crypto thing where yeah. he sat, files a defamation suit and he doesn't, he doesn't understand how that discovery, that whole discovery thing works. And now he wants to rescind it. Can yeah, talk about that? I'm going through my own defamation case right now, so yeah. that's why I felt appropriate to talk about it. So I, that is a very fair 
point to bring up that I make a video that's like anti-slap and then a video, oh, he should sue, yeah. both for defamation. Yeah. The reason why I came to Tozy's defense is I've been going through this. I've spent $150,000 in the last year. And for a guy, yeah, I'm doing pretty well, but that's a significant amount of money to me. It, I feel it. I'm not ashamed to share that, that yeah. it hurts. And so when I see someone that is using what I believe to be a slap lawsuit in the example of BitBoy, I came to a Tozy's defense immediately, even emotionally, just like, oh, I, neither of you should go through this. As men, come together and make a video together and address whatever you're talking about. None of you want to go the lawsuit route. Lawsuit is only a win for lawyers. Yeah. It's an insane process where everyone loses. And uh, it upset me to see that because I want YouTube to be a place where we can criticize each other. And then that brings about conversation. And it, the best conversation is when two people disagree, but you're respectful towards each other. I made a video about this person saying he was a dirtbag in the Atosis example, and here's why. And then BitBoy could come back and say, oh no, here's why I'm not. And that creates great content. Everyone wins, everyone gets views, everyone gets to tell their side of the story, but you start going towards defamation, it's just a waste of money. You also have an example of someone with a lot more money than another. And if you're making, if you're a creator and you're just getting by, you're making five, six, seven K a month maybe, that's great. But if you've got bills to pay and then you get sued, you're gonna get wiped out. Horrible. Wiped you, out, dude. I paid 150 grand. Like, that's insane. I, I'm insanely lucky to be able to earn that much to be able to pay that much. Uh, well, well, let's get to that in yeah. a second because I do want to talk to you about the vagaries of the case. Do you remember Nick Ritchie and the dirty and how Bulzarian got rid of him? So a lot of people don't realize this. This is one of the, one of my favorite things about Dan Bulzarian is he got rid of Nick Ritchie from the dirty. A lot of people. Do you remember this from the book? Oh, sorry. I thought you were gonna talk about the case with Hulk Hogan. No, we, we we'll get to that in yeah. a second. But Nick Ritchie. Uh, claimed he you know the way he would get away with it was that people would make a comment and then he would comment on the comment and the comment was that this girl said that uh she caught a venereal disease from bulzarian that's it, right all right so nick they went and they asked they made they made nick ritchie or they made the dirty prove that that comment was actually anonymous they were able to prove that the comment actually was initiated by the dirty and then the girl that they supposedly said made the comment then later said she did not make the comment. So they proved that they made the comment that something that was defamatory, that he had given this girl a venereal disease that he did not. He also had months of blood tests proving he did not have that venereal disease wow. additionally. And so they got into a defamation suit and they, basically they were gonna sue him for more money than it was worth. And Dan went, went to the lawyers for Nick Ritchie and basically said, well, here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna put a pile of money in here and I'm gonna burn the motherfucker and you're gonna put a pile of money in. And we're gonna keep burning the money until one of us quits. That's how it's gonna work. And so they fired, this is the truth. Nick Ritchie stopped working at the Dirty because he went after Bulzarian and lost. He didn't lose in a defamation case, a potential defamation case. That's what happened. That's essentially what happened. Nick Ritchie is a, a scourge on this fucking planet. There are, I, I'm telling you right now, there's at least 20, 30 people, I don't care, you can come after me, who have committed suicide because of the things that he said about. I don't care what he said about these girls, if he thinks it's true or whatever, he deliberately went after people to harm them emotionally. He went after all these, these girls and several of them committed suicide because of the things that he said. Several of them committed suicide. What, what he did to them was fucking horrible, right? And, and it was just like one of these things, when, when I heard Dan was the one who got rid of him, I was like, congratulations, bro. That was one of the greatest. I don't know how that guy can Took walk. Took out the trash. I don't know how that guy can walk around uh, Las Vegas without security. I'm sure he has security with him. But like, how do you sleep at night knowing some of the horrible shit you did to people? Reminds me of that. I watched a Netflix documentary recently, the, the one, are you up at night or something? Are you still yeah. up at night? You familiar yeah. with that? It was kind of similar where yeah. they posted people, like people could post girls nude photos against yeah. their consent. Yeah. That was wild. Uh, again, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that, uh, that Nick Ritchie made them, like pushed them over and committed, like, committed murder sure. or whatever. What I'm saying is it was such a contributing factor to so many people hurting themselves and attempting suicide or committing suicide. So many people, and he was responsible for that. Have you seen the book about being publicly shamed? And no. how it's the worst? I remember the RSD Julian case, the yeah. whole thing with the CNN. Yeah. And I remember after that, there was a book that he talked about a lot, which was like something about publicly shamed. And mm -hmm. it was, so you've been publicly shamed, I think is the title. Mm. And anyway, it's about how public shaming, like a lot of psychologists, really smart people have looked into it. It is like the worst thing to ever do to anyone. Like if you want to ruin thing, yeah. someone's life or if you want to change behavior, you publicly shame them. Yeah. And uh, to your point, it sounds like they were very publicly shamed to the mm. point where it could drive some negative behavior. Well, I don't think it changed him at all because I, I, I don't think he has any empathy for any human. There's no way. Oh, sorry, he could... no, no, no. The people, the people who are the oh, victims, for sure. Right, their their lives were forever changed. For sure, yeah, for sure. Shamed. Yeah, um, I'm sure Nick Ritchie doesn't feel shame for it at all. I don't think he's capable of shame in any way whatsoever. Let's go uh, talk about this real quick. So with the bit the bitboy bitboy crypto thing, 
you thought that he filed a fraudulent defamation case. A frivolous. A frivolous. Different. Yeah, frivolous. frivolous. And so he's going, well, how, how does that get resolved? He ended up dropping it. Okay. So he filed the lawsuit, and then Atozi does this video. He raises $200,000. BitBoy realizes, uh, I'm in a fight. I, it feels like one of those where you're the bigger, tougher guy, yeah. and you call on the little, you're bullying the little kid, and then he shows up with all his friends for a one-on-one -on -one fight, and you're like, oh, wait a second, this is no longer fair, yeah. right? That's what it felt like, so he dropped it. And did, I mean, and the other part was the discovery. We'd actually go into BitBoy crypto Absolutely. some of his claims and that might not make him look too very good absolutely and yeah it, it becomes a, a losing battle for everyone just the cost associated but also the discovery not everyone wants to get into because if i make claims if i say you're committing fraud yeah i believe you are doing something with investors money and yeah. you're committing fraud i have proof i have a, an investor that invested in your fund he came to me and gave me this stuff okay so i have a reasonable source reason to believe he's credible now the burden's on you. No. I, I believe you're committing fraud. Can you please prove me, to me that you're not? Now you need to open up the books to prove to me you're not. Yeah. And if you're doing anything shady, uh-oh. I heard secondhand about this guy I used to work with that was going to sue me. And I just remember thinking, like, the reason why he never told me personally, and the reason why he never told me is because I know this guy's never paid taxes on some of his uh, income. And I also know that... Um, that he, I have receipts for at least six other people who he's stolen money from. And it's like, bro, if you please sue me, like this is gonna be a fucking layup drill if you try to sue me. I'm gonna yeah. get, I'm gonna catch everything from you. But yeah, it was one of these funny things. Because defamation's about talk. character. Yeah, for that's sure. The, that's the key. And that's where your character comes in. When you call someone a dirtbag or you say someone's doing certain things, then it is the burden in some sense is on them to prove that it's false. Yeah, if you call me a piece of shit, that's fine. It helps the algorithm. If you yeah. call me a criminal, yeah, then I think it's sued. different. I yeah. think we all agree that it's, it's uh, there's a line. Um, the lawsuit you're dealing with, can you yep. talk anything about that? Yeah, sure. It's a defamation case. It yeah. sucks. I hate every part of it. Yeah. <laughs> Is there anything you I, would take back? Would you not have handled this at all? I don't think I did anything incorrectly. Okay. And so with a defamation case for anyone watching, uh, because I know a lot of people have this fear of getting sued in life. Uh, what's very important as a YouTuber is that you validate your sources and that you validate that they're credible. So if some random guy emails you and is like, I got dirt on Michael Sartain, and you don't even ask like, okay, what's your association with him? Like, yeah. can you show me any proof that... So anyway, with mine, yeah, I simply interviewed someone. That someone has a very firsthand experience with uh, a gentleman who is very big on social media. Mm -hmm. And that person believes that some things that were said by my guest were defamatory. And uh, there was a lot of reason to believe not only from public record, from public arrests and, and certain things that have happened on public record, but also from emails that this guest of mine had received from clients of this guru. And so from my perspective, I did nothing wrong. Yeah. I'm not liable for the charges in well, any way. Why does this take so long? Why does it take 150000 uh, Money and time. The reason why is because there is a process. I very much respect the legal process, and I like that it is elongated because of how expensive it is. I'd, I don't sit on cash. Yeah. So if this was all in 30 days, I would have been bankrupt. There is a process, so I present questions to you. There's a, a bunch of different stages is yeah. probably the best way to put it. So there's uh, documents I send to you. You have 30 or 60 days to respond. When you respond, I might need to 30 to 60 days to respond to those, and it becomes this game you play. Uh, we're currently in Discovery. Discovery also includes subpoenas. So you need to, or, or excuse me, depositions. So you depose someone. Well, their schedule might not be for two months. Mm. And so it just elongates over time. Do you think Discovery may backfire on this person? I believe so. Okay. And when the videos come out, I am going to enjoy it very much when okay. they get released. Okay. Got it. Yeah. That yeah. is the problem, man. I mean, if you're going to yeah. if you're going to sue someone for defamation, they get to come after you as well. They get yes. to open the books. You get on to you. learn a lot. For uh, sure. Not necessarily everything, because people can easily hide. I mean, the the trick with lawsuits and what's good and bad is you are under oath. You are expected to act in a certain way. If I were to ask you, did you live in Dallas, Texas, in 2006? You could either say yes or no. Mm -hmm. I can show belief that you did, but you can also say, no, I didn't, or, or whenever you lived there, or UT Austin. Yeah. I, no, I did not live there, and we're kind of relying on you to tell the truth. So it is tricky if you're dealing with someone who is not of a certain moral fabric. They could lie about certain things, but for the most part, you will learn about uh, a lot in Discovery. Uh, I'm just asking about some individual guys that you did. Uh, ones yeah, let's like do it. Mr. Organic or Cody Covers. Like what? What? Yeah. Can you tell me? Mr. Like, Organic was a really fun video. What was that like? Um, so I made a video about something he was promoting, mm -hmm. and I'm not a big fan of promoting casinos or sports books. I'm totally okay with gambling, yeah. but I don't like this game of like if you want to win some money this weekend, you can gamble. Nor if it's not your gig. Like if you're a gambler and you're just like this is the best casino. Nothing wrong with that. Anyway, he was just promoting a, a casino that I didn't care for, and it was nothing against him. It was just the act of promoting this. And so then he came back at me and called me a racist and had like a little fun at my expense. And said to do with the bags, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. So then I, I made a response kind of clowning on him. Well, my point was that 
I believed he would promote anything along with other influencers. He, he just happened to be the subject of the video. And so I thought, what better way to prove this point than to create a, a fake crypto coin and get him to agree to promote it? And I didn't so, realize this. Oh, you didn't see this video? No. Oh, so I... So you baited him into promoting a him, crypto coin. Yes. Uh, it was that called you made up. It was called T-Rex Inu. Yeah. Because there was a, a movie coming out this summer centered around Jurassic Park. Yeah. So I was like, oh, it'll be great. We'll start promoting it in April, May, June. And then the movie comes out in July and we'll... We'll, uh, we'll cash in on you know, yeah. the hype around T-Rex T -Rex and T-Rex Inu coin. He's like, yeah, bet. So I went out to LA and confronted him in person. Yeah. So the whole time he thought I was this fake character. I had a security guard yeah. with me and yeah. I pulled up on him. So what happened? Wait, I haven't seen this video. I'm going I'm to watch this right after this. Yeah, it, I think it's the best video I've ever made, all things considered. It was, a, it was a great experience and I have nothing but positive things to say. When you're respectful to me in person, I'm not going to disrespect you. Yeah. He was nothing but respectful to me on in camera and off camera. He was super cool. He's a character. He's, he plays into the character. He gets it. He gets attention. And for what his pursuits are in life, I think he's very successful. Okay. Uh, I don't necessarily agree that I don't like the crypto coin he promotes, this Volt Inu, which I think they're all scams and Ponzi schemes. But, sure. but for him, that's his lane in life. I call it out. He, he, um, he can live whatever life he wants to live. He was nothing but cool with me, and he was, he was pretty fun. Like, I, I, if he came out here and hit me up, I would go to dinner with him for sure. Wow. But okay. he, he was super cool, but the video was, was great. I definitely got to check that out. Cody Covers? Yeah. Cody Covers, cover, like covering bets? Yeah. Is yeah, these guys better? are clowns, man. They make money, though. It's, it's almost sad. When I realized how many young men will sign up for these courses and points, uh, or the, excuse me, the sports betting, it's bonkers. Yeah. The, the one with Carvana blew me away because that's, that's that Carvana tower that's over here by mm -hmm. I-15. I didn't really understand what Carvana was. They were set, they were literally selling cars they didn't even have the deeds to. Yes. You got into the whole thing about corporate greed that yep. was going on. Can you go into that? Yep, sure. So I, I think right now we are seeing this most prevalently in real estate, something that bothers me very much so, and that is greed by landlords that are pursuing profits above all else. Like, dude, you're dealing with humans. Like for me with real estate, I house a lot of people because i rent by the room so i have a lot of tents and a lot of them are struggling like that's why a lot of cases that's why you're renting like you don't make yeah, that much more and, sure. and to like kick people out just so you can make a little more profit i personally hate it i get the game i get when you're managing a lot of money the goal is more profit yeah. i totally get it but in the same vein like dude we're all humans we're all in this together if you're overcharging all these tenants and you keep ra raising rents to the point where they're like barely breathing i equate it to that scene in titanic where I think Leo DiCaprio has that scene where he's like trying to find air, he's gasping for yeah. air. That's how I feel like a lot of Americans are right now, especially younger, that they're really struggling. And anyway, I've seen just so much greed out of corporations. Yeah, there's another part, like obviously that you have the right to raise your prices, yeah, but when you do, you don't just incur an, an added price. There's an opportunity cost, a cost to move. Yes. There's a cost associated with moving. And then I have a feeling, at least in my personal experience, every time I've had someone try to raise the prices like that on me and I move, all of a sudden my entire security deposit went away. Yes. My apartment was pristine, but yes. you take my whole security deposit, got it, okay. Dude, yeah. I hate that practice. And, yeah. then, and then there's even stuff with property management companies that will accept an application fee, and then when you don't get the place, they keep the fee. Mm. Like, come on, bro. So much. Uh, I, I, there's a lot of stuff in real estate that I don't care for. Um, the 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 term pyramid scheme was mm -hmm. thrown around when you thought it was inaccurate, dealing specifically with Hustlers University and Andrew Tate, Sterling Cooper, uh, Tristan Tate, Justin Waller, all those guys. Can you talk about the difference between affiliate marketing, multi-level marketing, pyramid scheme? Yeah, absolutely. I think words really matter. I yeah. think it's important. I very much adhere to this world of like, yo, when I say something, my words matter and there's meaning behind it. And so when you have a social media where everyone's labeling something as a pyramid scheme, I think the, the people who hurt are the people who are trying to understand the world a little better. They're, they're following people on social media to understand finance and investing. And so when they hear pyramid scheme, it's, oh, it's a scam. But then they can't evaluate what a pyramid scheme actually is. A pyramid scheme is essentially you're investing in something that doesn't exist. You're basically recruiting people and their, their money into the scheme, their quote unquote initial investment is the returns to previous investors. It's in a completely illegal scheme. Mm. So when you start calling, it's in line with criminal claims. If, yeah. I, if I say you're running a pyramid scheme, that is a criminal accusation. And I think it matters. Uh, MLMs, the difference between pyramid schemes and MLMs, the reason why MLMs aren't necessarily is because they sell a product. They do. And so if they focus on the product, nothing wrong with that business model. But when you focus on the recruiting, that's where it starts think, to get I think MLMs area. get mixed in there because they most do. of them, 98% of the people don't make any money. That's and they only make money from recruiting, Correct. which is where it gets into pyramid scheme. Yeah. So anyway, and then affiliate marketing is something I'm trying to get in more now yeah. because I see how great the money is. If your program, for instance, your program, if I believe in your program and I think it helps young men, 
not only am I benefiting my audience because, hey, stop following these guys over here. Please take this course. Yeah. And if I'm running business, if I'm sending business your way, creating revenue for your business, I deserve a cut. That's how the world should work. Yeah. And, and you should want to do that. If I send you 10 people that are signing up for your course that are now aware of your course because of my video, I deserve a cut. And that's what affiliate marketing what is. Was, what was Hustle University? Were they giving half? With, was it a 50% affiliate No, fee? it was just an affiliate. It was like 10% or 20%. Was and there 10%? Was, wow. A, according to Tate, and Jesus. I, don't, I don't have any data on I thought it was this. way higher than that. No, according to uh, Tate, uh -huh. he says that only, it was like 6% of people were actually affiliates. Okay. So like very minimal. So people, it's a pyramid scheme. It's a Ponzi scheme. Dude, it, it's a course. You, there, yeah. There's no pyramid or Ponzi. It was, that was really frustrating. I get very frustrated yeah. with when people use words incorrectly and then say it with conviction. It, it very much bothers me. Yeah. <laughs> like, dude, you at least be right. Like at least take 10 minutes I, to understand I, the difference. I think, I think they will write books about what he did. Someday, because he became like legitimately what he did to go to have 4 million followers, legit followers on Instagram, to get the blue check mark, to get where he's doing six and a half million dollars a month. And that didn't include War Room, by the yeah, way. War Room, of course, so, is yeah. a bunch, bunch more money. And then to completely hack the algorithm. People talk about hacking the algorithm on YouTube. I didn't even notice YouTube. I noticed he hacked the algorithm on TikTok, yep. right? And he hacked the algorithm with stories and with reels. That's mm -hmm. where I saw him hack the algorithm. I didn't even notice YouTube. But you're right. Everywhere I looked, I saw Andrew Tate for a good couple of weeks. And then he made this comment. He was the most Googled person in the world. Well, I know. I mean, it's pretty probably for a couple of weeks, especially yep. for a few days. 100% he was the most Googled person in the world. Yep. And so a lot of people had a problem with him saying, well, I'm the most famous person in the world. Well, this is one of the metrics of fame. So I get that. But man, it was just one of these things where like, regardless of you don't like it, something happened here. Like, take note that something what happened. What can we learn from this? What can we learn from this? Like, because, oh, like, I'm with you. I'm like, let's get into affiliate marketing. Dude, affiliate marketing is the way to go. Yeah. And there's a lot of young men who are trying to figure out how to increase income. You know, mm -hmm. they might DM me, hey, Spencer, I love your videos, but uh, how do I make more money? Dude, affiliates, you want to know how to meet someone you really like? Start doing affiliate deals or start making YouTube videos about, like, your program, for instance. Like, yeah. let's say someone uh, did a, a cool biography on you without yeah. you knowing and you're like, wait, this guy just did all this work for me and sent, and there's people calling saying, hey, I watched, you know, John Smith's video. You're probably going to want to talk to him. For sure. Right. So if you, as an affiliate, and this is what I did not do well from the start. If I could go back, one thing I could improve on, get into the affiliate game early. Make sure to do due diligence on products and services. Yeah. And if you like them, you promote them. And you'll realize, dude, you can real run, you can run real business on YouTube when you get eyeballs. Like for me, I did a sports betting video today. I thought no one would care. I thought it was a really good video, yeah. but at the end I did a call to action, which is a syndicate. And I was like, if you want to partner with these guys, email me or something. Yeah. I've already had like four or five people email me. That's crazy. They're like I got local bookies. I'll be the, dude, they're the perfect partners and I get a cut. This is all. Like, I'm just, I'm waiting for Michael Sartain exposed video oh. <laughs> with the big question mark. I mean, with some crazy look on my face. And then we give you like a little affiliate code at the bottom. Oh, yeah. That'd be hilarious. So all right, man. I made it. I made it. Um, can you go, because I just had Roll Tomasi on. Can you go over um, what you, from your estimation, what you saw happen with the pickup community and then the red pill community? The good parts, the bad parts, the transition. Yeah, absolutely. To, yeah. So I make a lot of negative tint videos, which uh -huh. is, or it's like criticism, right? I'm a critic. Yeah. I made a positive video about RSD, even though a lot of people think it's a scam company. They got negative perceptions of the And the reason why is I think the pickup community is one of the best things to ever happen to young men. You have a lot of people who are without fathers, without yeah. a grown man figure in the good side. I'm not talking about the bad side, the yeah. good side of pickup world where better yourself, work on yourself, go to the gym, dress a little better, work on your physique. And, and then what, when that, you see a cute girl, walk is, up yeah. and respect her, walk up and say, hi, present your best self. And if she is not interested, you walk away because there's other girls. And when you're taught the right lessons, and then, you know, if she's interested, get her phone number. And I'll tell you, young men, when you do that for the first time, when you see a cute girl and you go get her number and you walk away and you, there's no high that can match that. When right. you're like, that cute girl is smart, funny, she's educated, and I just got her phone number and she wants to go on a date on Thursday night, the best feeling in the world. So Pick Up to Me was one of the most profound and impactful periods of my life. And I'll never stop talking about how positive an impact RSD had on me. Yeah. And I think Pick Up during its heyday was instrumental to many young men. I was sure. in the community and I saw so many young men like going from directionless to at least like they were at least trying to work on their confidence and get a high paying job. They had some direction in life. And then the Red Pill community came along. I think the Red Pill exists because you have a lot of people who are playing this dating game where the whole game is rigged against young men. 
and they're having bad experiences. And so now they have this voice of like, it's not your fault. You know, all the women in the te- teach the, how the women really act and all they want is the guys with the 666 and all this stuff. <laughs> That's so I, I, think, uh, I think it exists. It, it can provide a good voice. I think there's a lot of good with the red pill to understand the world better. And if it introduces you to psycho- psychological books or human psychology, or you want to understand women better yeah. so that you can understand the world around you better, that is nothing but healthy behavior. I think where it becomes a problem is when I think sometimes they go a little bit to the extreme and maybe that's to prove a point or because they've realized like that's what gets the attention and gets the eyeballs. But there are times where I'm like, eh, I don't get the sense you love women. And not that yeah. look, you can, people can live whatever life. If you don't love women, that's your thing. But I don't think that's healthy for, for sure. the environment. Well, it's not, it's uh, like, I don't believe in misogyny, not because I'm woke. I believe in, I don't believe in misogyny because it's a bad game. Yeah. It doesn't help you with women. It's, right. it's actually really guys, bad. All these guys have pictures of nothing but cars and jewelry. And like, where are the women? Yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, I, I don't think RSD was ever a scam because RSD was not promising lay counts. Right. That was the issue. Right. Like RSD was literally like, it, they were saying, improve yourself. Now, where I think the, the, the confusion happened or, or, you know, the complaints was some of the infill footage. Uh, yes. Which got, so I mean, we're, we're saying outcome independent work on yourself, and then it's infill footage of you trying to pick up a woman to have sex with her. I think that's where some of the incongruencies happen, or like the videos of like a girl taking Owen away or something like that. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I and think, partially, I think, and part of my whole like brand is, is this person legit? I think what matters is, is this guy actually going out and getting laid? I think that matters too, because yeah, you could teach. Well, RSD uh, was not trying to make that a metric that they were being judged by. At least true. at the end, they weren't. True. At least at the end, they true. weren't. And especially at the end, after the Julian Gate thing happened, when everything turned to trauma release and meditation, they certainly weren't trying to do that. So that, that was an interesting... That's why I don't... See, this is where we get into that line we were talking about with Tony Robbins. If Tony Robbins is there to make you feel good and, you make, make, and he makes you feel good, what I can't even... It's not whether or not he's a scam or not. I can't even put him in the... Right. I can't even... There is no metric by which for me to measure him. Yeah, for which yeah. it is good. Yeah. There's no metric. Yeah, there's no metric. Is this investment good or bad? I don't know. Let's look at the profit and loss. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. That makes it a lot easier. But in that case, I just... How do you evaluate emotions? How do, how do I judge the efficacy of a trauma release coach? I don't know how to do that. Right. right. Yeah. It'd be really in depth. And yeah, there was no, there would need to be like a third party to evaluate people. And then you're getting into people's words, which is always convoluted. For sure. Absolutely. So that, that's interesting. Now, I, I do want to know, uh, Adam22, mm-hmm. uh, did he reach out to you? How did you end up on No Jumper? He reached out to me. Uh-huh. Yeah, funny enough. He likes my content organically. Okay. Yeah. He watched a few of my videos and, and liked it and reached out to me and, directly. And, and let's talk about this, because I do like where he had, he had very little intro, very little outro. I think I see so many podcasts that were so overproduced. Yes. And I just tried, tried to keep mine really fucking short. I didn't want to have entrance music, like make things really quick. And I watch yours, and they're 10 minutes 13 minutes, somewhere in that area. YouTube? Yeah, YouTube. Oh, you want to talk about like YouTube game? I could talk about this all day long. Yeah, yeah for, the, for the YouTube game. Yeah. And then it, 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 it's so digestible because on the, on the drive back last night from Vegas or from Los Angeles, I listened to tons of your videos at double oh, speed. Appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. And then it was like, I didn't know where one ended and the next began because I'm funny. just listening. Yeah. So I thought that was interesting. Can you he, talk about He actually gave me a compliment when I hung out with him. He said, you know what I like about your videos is they just end abruptly yeah. and then the next one starts. And it's like, oh yeah, I'll watch the yeah. next one. I never thought of that. I analyze the YouTube algorithm from the sense of, I want people to enjoy my content to the best of my ability to produce it. And so I have always cared most about the viewer's attention and their interest in my videos. I never want to waste their time. I want to get to the point right away. There's also a game being played, which is where you want to keep people engaged as mm. long as possible. So if you add in the, for a while it was like and subscribe and comment. I don't think likes and comments actually mean anything to the algorithm in mm. 2022. I would argue this to the death. I don't think it matters. I think what matters most are people clicking on your stuff and are they watching? Yeah. Because the algor- if, if people are constantly clicking on your videos and they're watching the whole video, not only do they like your stuff, they're telling you they like it by their behavior, but also they're watching all the videos. It's valuable. They're, you're watching the whole thing. Whatever yeah. the title was, it was clearly valuable enough to watch the whole thing. Do you, so you look at view times as comparison to the total All I look video? at is, well, for me, I look at certain metrics, which is how many views on the first day of upload. Okay. And then I look at click-through rate how many people are clicking, and then I look at how long people are watching. Dude, Only thing is matter, that matter the, to me. The, the how many people are watching, or I'm sorry, the, the how many, you don't look at the time they're watching. Like the, uh, the, the average view duration average view is the duration. number that matters more. Yep. What, what numbers did you start at? What numbers have you worked up to? Can you talk about that? The best videos are 60 to 63%. Wow. Okay. Most are 55. The worst are around 50 or under 50. 50%. 50%. So we're talking about 13 minutes, so we're talking about six minutes. Correct. It's really hard to not watch your whole video. I think that's really interesting. So I've, I've very much treat it like a, uh, a system 
where my videos are very much tailored to your attention, mm. which is I try to limit the amount of time on one like specific point. So I, I generally try to do like something about the subject and then my opinion or my talking point to it, then add in a video. So I try every 10 seconds, I try to progress the script. Every and 10 so, seconds, yeah. Yeah, every 10 seconds or so. And uh, I very much treat it almost like a movie where you're always wanting to advance the script or advance the story or there's one thing that Neil Strauss talked about that's always stuck with me, and that is in his editing process, he has three different stages. And one of them, he says, uh, is this for me? Is this for the audience or whatever? However his process works. But one of them is, is this necessary to the video? If I can take it out and it doesn't change the video, it needs to be removed. Interesting. And so for a while, YouTube, YouTubers were trying to gain the system because if you do have a longer video, then naturally your watch time is going to be higher. My longer videos perform better just because people are watching longer. They just get pushed more. But I will not do that at the mercy of a worse video. So no. I'll constantly take out stuff where I'll watch on like the third time through watching to make sure the video is finally tuned. That's not needed. I'll take it out. Uh, some other I'll channels. Take out a clip. Some other channels are doing the, a secondary channel for clips. Yes. Yep. Tim, and those channels I'm seeing grow faster than yeah. the primary channel. Uh, we just hired someone this week. That they're going to start doing them for me. One thing Smart. I did uh, because my videos are so long, two and a half hours long. Uh, as I go through, after I'm done with this, I'm going to go through and I timestamp the entire video. And I'm very meticulous. Makes it watching yeah. much easier. Uh, I, I time stay longer. I timestamp all the way to like the minute, like each minute. I think you're allowed 100 timestamps per video, something like that. So I'll go through and I'll timestamp it. And then I put one asterisk if I say something cool, two asterisks if you say something cool, three asterisks if this is, has to be a TikTok. Oh, Does that make cool. sense? Then my editors see, they start, they get in there, they immediately go for all the three asterisks. Occasionally, there's a four asterisk, which means you don't get a choice in this one. This one is going to be a TikTok. And then, then they'll send it to me. And usually what I'll do is there's an um or an ah, or I'm like, here's what I'm trying to say. And I'll cut that out. And we go right to the first word because this is Bulzerian who told me this is because he's blown up on TikTok too. He's like, first three seconds. Yes. Has to be something, has to be some explosion, some boob, some cleavage, some word in the first three seconds. If you can't get to the first, the word cocaine or prostitute has to be in the first three seconds of the TikTok. And when, when my editor, I had to keep explaining this to her because she wanted me to like fill in all this context. I'm like, put the context in the title, first three seconds, ha yeah. I have to hit them in the fucking face. And so the, we're gonna get into the whole clip thing because my, my content is so fucking long. But yeah. that really helped me was the timestamp thing. Yes. The timestamp thing, as sending, a viewer. To, sending to, as a viewer, and then later on, now I can pull 10 clips out of each mm. two and a half hour video. Now I have content, because I do three reels per day on Instagram. That, that's, that helped me out a ton, just yeah. doing that. Keeps you relevant, for sure. Yeah, so with YouTube, you want the hook, what Mr. Beast says. Mr. Beast is the best person to follow for this, but he's yeah. like, hook immediately. So I, I try to do something cool, like one sentence, just hook you in, and then I immediately go towards the subject of the video yeah. and provide some type of supplementary evidence where it's like, this is clearly what this video is about, and this is what you're going to get from the video. This is madness. You do all your editing. I do everything You do three channel. videos a week, and you do all the editing. Yeah, I don't do three anymore. Okay. I was, and I nearly burnt myself out. So Q4 of last year was huge, man. I was yeah. 40 to 60K a month on AdSense. Okay. It was nuts. 40 total for everything you're doing? Just 40 to 60K a month. Okay. Yeah, three videos a week, but I was burnt out, and I... Wait, wait, wait. Does that include what YouTube... No, I'm sorry. That AdSense. Is AdSense. That is I was yeah. not doing sponsors yeah. at the time. Okay, cool. And uh, But I burnt out, and I, I kind of had that moment of like, what does money really mean? Like, okay, I'm making yeah. way more money now, but I was... I wasn't, I hate, like, I wasn't happy. No, I was doing great, but I was burnt out. And I was like, yeah. this is clearly not a 10-year plan. So at some point, I'm going to have to stop this. And so then moving into Q1 of this year, I was like, man, I'm exhausted. Let me try and, like, tone back a little C. So I, in April, I did one video a week mm. to see, like, a little bit more balance in life, just to try to evaluate, like, do I really want to keep pursuing all this high income if I'm not, like, actually spending, a, it, like, a night going out to dinner or something? Is it, is, it, is it super deleterious on your income on AdSense now that you're doing one versus three? It sucks, man. Last yeah. month was 5,500. Okay. In comparison to last year, it was wow. like 25. So big drop. Yeah. I'm going to say the most ironic thing I could possibly ever say to you. You know what it is? Start a fucking coaching program. Oh, yeah. No. So this is why I'm getting the affiliate game. Yeah. So I just bought equity in a buddy's company. Yeah. So I'm going to start promoting that company. And then uh, I'm going to try and do... So I do a lot of sponsorships now, which yeah. helps bridge the gap. So yeah. the, the money from sponsors is good. You, you understand a lot of what I do is because of guys like you who are skeptical. You understand? Yeah, like I'm always showing receipts. Yes. Right? No, that's very good. My, my receipts are, it's a networking program. So who's on my podcast? I have Ty Lopez, Dan Blazarian, Dan Fleischman, like the, these big networkers. I had Jay Cutler mm -hmm. and Dr. David Boss came on the podcast. So it's a networking program, right? I, I don't know this to be the case, but I think it's the case. I, I, maybe not today, but a couple of months ago, I'm pretty sure I was the only person in the world with Dan Bilzerian and Andrew Tate's phone number. I'm pretty sure I was the only be. person in the entire world that had both of their phone numbers. I'm trying to think who else, but like they, cause they're completely different circles. 
uh, like Andrew does not come out here and party. But, I, right. but I'm, I could be wrong. There may be some LA promoter who hung out with him once, but I think I was. And and it was one of these situations where I'm like texting both of them back and forth. Like it was it was like this That's weird. Wild. It was this weird situation. Yeah. It was, it was, In the social media world, those are the two big dogs. I knew. Dan didn't know anything about Andrew a couple months ago because I'd asked him about it. When Andrew and I first started texting, I'm like, do you know who Andrew Tate is? And then I told him he does this webcam house and he's like, oh, that's awesome. Like, that seems like a really great way to make money. I was talking to him about it. And then this went back when I played paintball at his house at Bulzarian's house. Bulzarian lives a couple blocks that way. Oh, nice. Um, and so uh, it was just one of these weird situations where I'm like, I'm teaching a networking course and I'm networking. Like, I, I got into the Playboy Mansion. I didn't pay for it. Crystal Hefner invited me to the Playboy Mansion. I have the text messages to prove it. It's a networking course. I'm not. I'm not teaching you, I'm not promising you millions of dollars, but I am promising you if you do this, people are going to be more likely to want to talk to you, period. That's all I'm, that's all I'm promising you. And then I give you the first three steps. Fix your, step one, all the guys on MOA are saying this, fix your fucking Instagram, that's step one. Step two is build a list, so it's like somebody might have a, a, a vision board. I don't mm -hmm. have a vision board. I have the top 100 influential entrepreneurs I wanna meet, and I have their Instagrams right here on a Google spreadsheet, and over here to the left I have 4,000 female influencers that I want to come to my parties. That's my vision board. I don't follow all those people, but getting to, like, adding those people every day, you get more in flow. It's like, oh, everyone's at swim week in Miami. I didn't know there was a swim week. Everyone's on stage at Marquee Sky Deck during EDC. I didn't know there was a Marquee Sky. I didn't know what these things are. What's the difference between Joshua Tree, Coachella, and fucking Burning Man? I don't know, what but now I know because I tell guys this all the time. Every, like you and me, let's say we've moved to Des Moines, we have no social media following, nothing. There's a party going on somewhere in Des Moines with all the cool kids. Mm -hmm. And we're, we, because we have penises, we're not invited to that party. Right. They don't want us there. My job is to get you over that hump so that you do get invited to that thing. Does that make sense? Yeah. You my, get the invitation. You don't just know the address. You yeah, know the, you get the invitation. The, so my point is I want my guys to be able to bring 60 girls to a party. That's like kind of like, a, a, wow. like a, uh, an ancillary. Do they bring 60? I have maybe four guys who can bring 60. I have every guy who can bring like 20, wow. maybe 20, 30 girls to a party. That's the point is to be able to do that, right? And I, and I have the receipts to prove it. I have yeah. 50, five, zero testimonials on MOAMentoring.com. So that's, that's part of the thing I do. But here's the second thing. Eventually, when your social circle that you're growing gets so big, it doesn't, you don't find that other social circle. You are that other social oh, wow. circle. Does that make sense? Yeah, once like, you built a system, essentially the system becomes you. Yeah, like you're, you're, people come to you then. You're, you're trying to build this bubble of your social circle that eventually envelops the other one. Eventually, you become the other one, if that makes any yeah. sense, right? Yep. Like, it's like, like Dan Fleischman had a social circle, and I had one, but then I hosted his party. Now it's the same social circle. Like the cool kids aren't in 17 different places, they're in one place. Then eventually, you're at 10979 Shalon Road for the Ignite party watching Cardi B in front of you while Diplo's standing over here. Like, in the, in the, here's Machine Gun Kelly and right there, Logan. Like, this is not an exaggeration. Yeah, this is what I was wild. seeing with my own eyes. That now eventually your social circle envelops that social circle. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Now, now it's not like you're like, the, well, I'm, oh, it's the cool kids I got on stage at Excess. Well, now you're on stage at Excess and here's the weekend and there's uh, LeBron James and there's Drake. Like there is no, then you get to the point where there's no other social circle. God, that's a wild thought. You're, like, do you understand when you're, I'm you're at, at the, the play, when I'm at the Playboy Mansion, I'm like, there's no, no one somewhere else is like, wow, I'm having, <laughs> I'm at a higher status party than they. No, you're there. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's nuts. That's, that, then eventually you get to that point. Now that, at that point you have to be living in Los Angeles, right. Las Vegas, maybe San Diego, Scottsdale, but like that's, that's where it has. So these are the different stages. For somebody who like just joins the program, well, Michael, I, I'm not going to live in Los Angeles, whatever. But like, imagine getting. A, we'll use Chloe Teray because you know who she is. Chloe, if she if she if she's on your team, she's loyal. If she's not on your team, she don't give a fuck about you. I'm just going to tell you, I love you, Chloe. The thing about it is, uh, getting her attention is hard. Keeping her attention is fucking impossible. If you can get her attention, and now you're like, well, I'm a real estate agent. I live in Wichita, and I want to get all the mortgage brokers and all the real estate agents in the city to come to my event. Cake, piece of cake. You got in the Playboy Mansion. Right. You brought 70 girls to the Wish Mansion. The, getting real estate agents to come to your place, you're, dude, you can bench press 500 pounds and you're, they're asking you to bench press 100 pounds. It's a yeah. joke. That's what I teach. Does that make sense yeah. as far as the networking is what concerned? What you explained is, was my hope all yeah. along, which yeah. is I want to be the guy, and not that I should be this, like the only voice, not, I'm just some guy making YouTube videos, but yeah. I want to be the guy that can present the, here's all the shady stuff being done. Yeah. And that should shine a light on the good stuff because Hopefully. dude, mentors are so important to you in life. Like, yeah. dude, I, there, the amount of people I've watched on, about gyms training mm -hmm. to improve my bench press, the amount of people are going back to RSD that 
changed my life immensely because they put out effort and yeah. they were the good gurus. And then, I mean, just every area, YouTube growth, all these people I follow that provide YouTube growth secrets. My gosh, mentors are incredibly important to you. And so if you're a young guy and you follow the wrong mentors, you're spending time and energy and possibly money on the wrong people and you're not getting anywhere. I want to shed light. I want to, I want the, the, the light to be brighter on the awesome people because that everyone benefits. Yeah. I, I interviewed uh, Cole Gordon. He reached out to me. And, I see uh, some of his ads. Dude, 30 million a year in sales. Wow. Then he trained our sales guys and all of them came to me like, this guy's a fucking assassin. He's legit. He's legit. And yeah. we for, we quadrupled our revenue because of well, what he taught one us. One decision. Yeah. You hired decision. the right guy mm -hmm. in your businesses. That's, that's what but, I wanted to get to. But here's the thing. It's because he went on Brad Lee's podcast and then also because he peripherally, like the, Nick Cosman was another guy. These guys peripherally knew Dan Fleischman and Brad Lee. And that's where I kind of like were hire, I was hiring my, my people from them. Does that make any sense? Yep. Right. And like, it's really crazy. If you hire the right people, if I could just, you just knew who wasn't a scam, man, you can make so much money. Having high ticket closers, these guys are so incredibly good. I admire my, t my high ticket closers so much. These guys are great. My setters. Those guys are incredible. Yeah. My success coaches, those guys are incredible. And so I, that is the thing. But if you go the wrong path, you know what I'm saying, then, then it's, it's a disaster. And you spend up 10K on somebody who doesn't know what they're doing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and even worse, some of these investment schemes where you l truly lose your yeah. money. Like it's one thing to buy sure. a course and okay, maybe it's not that good, but it's one to you know, the, lose your money. The girl who makes my social media uh, content, uh, Char Modell, she's so good, I almost don't want to tell people about her because I'm going to lose her. Like, she's, like right. she's so good at it. She makes me three reels a day. Three reels a fucking day. She hits me up every night and she's like, approve this, approve this. And I'm just like constantly approving reels for her so she can get up like three, four days ahead. It's yeah. amazing stuff. Um, and because of that, we've been able to push so much revenue through the, the course that I don't need advertisers for my podcast. My, this is like all the guys in MOA watch this podcast. This is like an ancillary That's piece dope. to the, you know what I'm saying? This is my, yeah. free, this is my free training. Yep. That makes any sense, right? Yep. Awesome. Let's talk about a couple of things. I love this. 10 to 15% of people don't even complete the course. Bro, that is nuts. so true. That is so, it is so fucking frustrating. And the ones who pay me the most money, the ones who like drop the most, when I see, cause, uh, cause I have a Stripe account and it shows me who's paying all this money. And I see the guy with the most money. I'm like, all right, man, this guy's going to go through all of MOA. He's going to go through all of MOA advance. He's going to do all the assignments I give him. I'm going to have this guy being a fucking assassin. He's going to be a green beret when I'm done. I'd meet the dude and he's like, yeah, I didn't even make it through pillar one. Teach Wild. me how to do. And I'm like, bro, how? You spent me, you gave me all this money. I need to help you, you know? This is why I never go into the courses. I've only done yeah. one review of a course, and that was Tate's Hustlers University. Because I think a lot of the success is on the student. Yeah. Oh, even, even the worst fake gurus who give out some sales course, like, yeah, it's probably pretty decent. But a lot of it's on the student. At the end of the day, and I call it like there's a moment. So let's say a real estate, for instance. You take a real estate course. There's a moment. The second the course ends, you've been given all this information. You yeah. now have the adequate information to take the right step. When that moment hits, do you look for more information or do you look to take action? Yeah. And I think that is the moment that determines. For me, thankfully, I was always the type like, you give me some information, I just I go out and do it. I'll fail. I've lost a lot of money in my time, yeah. but I go out and do it. And over time, the doers are who make stuff happen. And I found that a lot of people who buy courses, unfortunately, they buy it and they get the feeling, oh, I'm feeling like I'm advancing in life. And then they keep looking for more information. They buy the next course yeah. and the next book and the next book and the next book and the next forum post. And they never actually... Do you, did you talk to homeowners? Did yeah. you actually go and try to buy a house? <laughs> we have Zoom calls, and we'll have anywhere with you know, like 70, 90 guys on whatever, and we'll publicly shame you if you don't do it. Good. The thing. We do that. Now, the problem is I have 400 guys in the course, more than 400 guys in the course, so a bunch of them never come on the calls, on the live calls. But the guys who come on there, when they ask questions, I'm like, they'll ask a question. I'm like, do you remember those first three steps? Did you do them? And I can check. Remember, I can check, bro. You have to show me your, your, your receipts. And they haven't done them. And then all of us are like, they were ganging up on him. Like, this is not the men of trauma release course. This is not the men of dithering, right. the men of theory, the men of blathering. It's the men of action course. You understand I'm, this is going to be hard. And that's, that's one thing. I don't know if I'm still at 10 or 15%, but I can't stand that idea that, that you're giving. That number's off, by the way. I think it's 10 to 15%. Uh, don't even don't even like view the course. Oh my I think God. like go through the course is like half. And yours might be a little different, yeah. but a lot of the fake guru course. Because remember, you're not using flashy. Like the way yeah. you sell is going to be a filter yeah. naturally, and so your filter is a little tighter. But a lot of the fake gurus who go the mass uh, direct response that use the Lambo, they got jewelry. Hey man, I make yeah. millions. They're going to catch everyone, so there is no filter. Um, I love this one. Opportunity. You just talked about this a second ago. Opportunity cost versus uh, content creation. Like you want to go to dinner and you could be costing yourself fifty thousand dollars. Like it, be, it, it does. It gets into this weird situation where if you like, like you had a, a job where you could make ten thousand dollars a day, 
like you'd be like, man, this is incredible. Look at all this extra money I have. Now I can take time off. But then yes. you don't want to take time off right. because you're making $10,000 a day. Right. Yeah. I've been trying to fight with this balance because no, no doubt I am unashamed in saying this. I am absolutely in the pursuit of money. I know what it brings yeah. to your life and I do not yet have the freedom. I want to reach a point where if YouTube shut me down, oh, I'm good in life. I'm not there yet. I want to fly private. If the LA Lakers are playing tonight and me and you want to go, let's get on a, a Jet Suite X tonight and yeah. pay $4,000 for tickets. And I don't even consider the cost. Yeah. I want that life and I'm doing whatever it takes to get to that life ASAP. And, uh, and so. Do, do, do you find yourself when you started making some money still like not spending any money? Did that ever happen to you? I invest every dollar. So my personal expenses are under $2,000 a month. That's insane. I live for free because yeah. I, I rent by the room. Yeah. And uh, actually, mine are probably some. Oh, if you count Chipotle, no. <laughs> so, anyway, yeah. no, I'm in the pursuit of investing. Unfortunately, the lawsuit has knocked me back many steps. Yeah. However, no, I invest every dollar. And so, yes, the pursuit of money was great, but I was burning myself out. And I want this to be a long term game. And I was, I was going to have the excess capital today, but it would ruin the long term potential. And so I realized I need to balance it out a little more where I don't get go insane up here. <laughs> like, bro, I'm, I'm still. Uh, the other day I was buying a ticket because I'm, I'm hosting a bikini competition in Jamaica next week uh, for a week. I'm going to be there for a photo shoot. And then next month I'm hosting Swimsuit USA's World Championship. And I was buying tickets to go out there. And it was like a couple hundred bucks more to go on United versus Spirit. And I remember how fucked up my back is by flying on Spirit. And I was just like, dude, I make money. Why right, am I tripping right. over this? This little fucking thing. And then the other day I took these, these girls out to dinner and it was 400 bucks and I didn't care at all because they, right. they were so hot. It's funny how, just, how just, illogical we can be at times. It's so illogical, bro. Yeah. I'm sleeping on my friend's couch with no air conditioner in Los Angeles because I don't want to pay money. But I'm like, I can afford, why am I like this? You know it's what I'm saying? It's weird because one of the main challenges in life, especially for an investor-focused yeah. gentleman, is wh at what point do you enjoy today or solve more problems today versus because yes theoretically if you could not spend a dollar today literally invest every dollar and be worth 50 million dollars at some point oh my gosh alex ramosi what he's doing living yeah. in the two bedroom two bathroom yeah. with this like saving every fucking dime yeah. he wants and to some be a billionaire pe some people who are making like a hundred grand a month and they're not even flying first class and you're like dude the point of money is to solve problems today and so the, the balance is at what point do you start spending more today where uh, instead of going out to a, a $20 a meal dinner, you say, you know, I'm, I'm going to start eating nicer. This is a tough challenge. Where do you start spending your money more? Because look, at the end of the day, we could all die tomorrow. Like that's the ugly truth. And what matter if you don't have, if you have all this money in your bank account and you could have saved, you could have spent it today to improve your life. Here's, here's the other thing. It's a tough. Like I tell my friends, like your money either should be making your life easier or it should be working for you to make yes. you more money. Yes. And one of the problems for me is like, I see these guys using money in order to impress women. And yeah. I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to try to brag, but I'm very happy with the women that I'm dating. The, I'm extremely happy with the women in my life and the abundance that I have. And I don't spend any money. So right. like, my question is now, if I have a bunch of money and I could spend it, and I've had this happen before where a girl flies herself out to see me numerous weekends. The first time I fly her out, her attitude completely changes. And it now makes me now not want to spend any money to fly her out. And I tell her, I was like, you understand when I pay for your shit, you start acting entitled. I'm not going to do, like I was better off like not paying for you to do anything. And it's just so Oh, I hate that. I really like I because I part of me is like, man, I wish I could. I don't know how to spend. There we go. That's the best way to say it. I don't. I'm like Warren Buffett. I don't know how to spend money. I legitimately I know how to make money. I don't know how to spend it. And mm -hmm. so that's one of the weird situations where like I've never tried to impress a woman with a car or a nice watch. I wear an Apple watch and I drive like a really nice. Um, I drive an extremely dependable car. How about that? We'll just say that. <laughs> to um, me, I have no problem with that. I have no problem with spending. Yeah. Like I want to be flying Jet Suite X. I want to be able to. Uh, I go love Jet to Suite X. Oh, it's I amazing. Love the shit I want to go out to LA for to spend a weekend and get a. But Jet Suite X is not expensive. No, it's not. That's yeah. the, kind of the yeah. funny. But but no, like go to L to L A for a weekend and get a nice Airbnb or something and do an event or something and spend two thousand on a weekend where you don't even think of the cost. Isn't it crazy? Yeah. Like I wish and I, could I can my, afford that today. Like I, once my lawsuit's over, I can afford I, a lot. I wish, I wish my brain worked like that, but I just can't. It's just yeah, so crazy. Maybe it's a shift. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about this. Um, you you wanted to get to the point where you were breaking stories. Do you remember this? Uh, and that those stories would actually have an actual change where people would realize, oh, this person's a scam artist. Yeah. And you were affecting people's lives positively by keeping them from getting scammed. Sure. Yeah, my opinion on that's changed a little. Once really? I realized, yeah. So this is like a dirty secret that I don't really share publicly, but 
I have impact, yeah. right? I make a video, 100,000 people see it. Maybe some people don't buy the course. You have impact for me. I mean, yeah. there's certainly people I've avoided. Yeah, yeah. so uh, no doubt about that. But realistically, all these guys who I've objectively proven, let's go sports betting specifically, objectively proven that they cannot win money in the long term and that it makes no mathematical sense to pay for their picks. And yet they keep getting bigger. And so the dirty truth is that social media attention matters most. And so this for is, the longest this time... This is clout I had, versus expertise. Yeah, and for the longest yeah. time, I kind of had this belief that yeah, when I come out with a story and I prove without a doubt, objectively, that so-and-so is not who they are, or who they say they are, or have the level of competence they claim to have, I thought it would change and alter human behavior. It does not in any way. And so, yeah, I, I enjoy making videos. I think there is an impact and I will continue doing so. However, the idea that I could really assist in helping people find the gurus versus the, excuse me, the good gurus versus the bad ones, and then I do not like the idea of canceling people or like shutting people's down their business down. I never want to be that type. But if someone is absolutely a fraud, I do want to bring light to it. And if it does negatively affect their business, good. That's that's a healthy marketplace, right? Yeah. But no, at this point, I don't think I really have that much impact. I mean, I think for some people, I think the people Maybe. smart enough. Like that's yeah. one, that's one of the hardest things is like as from an uh, economic standpoint, from socioeconomic standpoint, you want to help as many people as possible. Right. And then when you come to this realization that like some people don't want to be helped, like yeah. if you built houses for all the homeless people in Los Angeles, how many people just wouldn't choose to live in them? They'd still be living out on the street. Like, you know, it's, you can't help everybody. When you see you, people are paying you for your course and 10% of them are all, uh, the yeah. only ones, you, you, you kind of like, hey, you know what would be awesome? What if I'm just rich? What if I just get <laughs> rich and just not worry well, about one, it? One thing I've become comfortable with, I, I want to be an entertainer. I want to make great videos that yeah, are entertaining. They're very and if they're helpful and educational, great. But you're friends with Chloe Trey, for instance. Yeah. I've made a video kind of clowning on her. Yeah. I don't want to be in a situation where I were to be introduced to her and she looks at me like I'm some hater and I ruined her life. I do not want to be that. Well, if she does something shady. You're not ruining her no, life. No, certainly. Yeah. But she's just an example. Yeah. Like I don't I don't want to ruin people's lives. I just want to make a video. And if you make a claim like you are doing 10 house flips a month, and I can objectively prove that you have not done any in the last year. I want to make that video and let the audience decide, but not ruin the guy's life such that if we met in person, he would want to like fight me or something. For sure. Well, I'm sure a lot of them want to fight you. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. I want them to come fight me. Bro, I'm, I'm still, I still got this street <laughs> you got a size in me. Advantage. I still got this street in me, boy. I'm a, I, 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 I've, I cannot tell you how unhealthy this is, and I know it's terrible. I saw some of the comments you were leaving on one of your videos. I was like, oh, that's Bro, I odd. will go after your mom. I don't give a shit, bro. You do not. You're not going to take it as far as me. I welcome you guys to bring these hate comments because what happens is before I do, especially chest day, bro, when it's chest and triceps, <laughs> I go to Telegram and I go to all these Telegram groups and I just like, I'll post like something, me with some girls, and I'll get these hateful comments and I'll be like, bitch, you would never say this to my face. And I go after them for half an hour. It's crazy. what And like, and I do this same thing on my YouTube comments and I'll be like, Hey man, enjoy virginity. And I hope unemployment works yeah. for you. Your mom was just telling me she needs you to clean your fucking room. I will go at them, bro. And, and then I have the best workouts ever. <laughs> okay. I have the best do you, workouts. Ever. Do well, you see this as something you'd want to fix? Of course. Okay. At some point I need to stop doing this because, but the problem is that here's what, here's what, here's what happened. Initially it was like, Oh, did I do something wrong? And then I looked at how much money we we're making. I'm like, no, I'm good. And then, and then after a while, it was just like one of these things where I would, I would get into this argument and then I would go into my group coaching calls with like the guys and I was so amped up. And I just knew, I was like, if all I do is keep my clients from turning into these little, if you're a YouTube commenter and you're making personal attacks at me, you're a bitch. Like, I don't care. <laughs> you're just a loser. And it's just like, if I could just keep my clients from becoming those guys, I did okay. You have no avatar. You have no followers. And you're sitting there talking about, I talk too much on my podcast, which someone's going to say this now, right? I, I wanted to have a conversation with you. It wasn't just going to be an interview. There's plenty. You guys can look up. There's plenty of interviews of them. Um, the, you know, I wanted to have a conversation with like a back and forth. Guys will always say, Michael, you talk too much. And I'm like, oh, I checked out your podcast. It's fucking oh, yes. incredible. <laughs> Your podcast is fucking incredible. Dude, that's the funny part. When some of the people comment on my yeah. videos and like, Spencer, you should change your thumbnails. I'm like, can yeah. you share with me your credibility yeah. for, um, and, and the proof that you are better than me if, at YouTube? If someone said, change your thumbnails, I'll like, hey, bro, I'll look at that. If yeah. someone says, dude, you're a moron, change your <laughs> thumbnails. This is why your account doesn't grow and you're a dumbass. I would be like, hey, bro, I just checked out your thumbnails. They're fucking incredible. By the way, your mom said you wet your bed <laughs> last night. 
eat a dick. See, I like, think that's really unhealthy. Yeah, of course. Boy, like, from an outside perspective, I would hope you work on that. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. You're too successful to care bro, about that I, negative energy. That's the thing. Like, at first, I wasn't that successful, yeah. and I was still doing that. Got it. And, bro, it, no, it got bad. I would text guys, I would get guys up on IG and be like, I live at Panorama Towers, 4525 D-Mart. I'll tell you right now, you can oh, come wow. find me, and I will have a film crew come out while I slap you in the face. In my, my. But it was bad. <laughs> it was bad, bro. Um, yeah, so I, I, I admit it is an unhealthy thing that I have, but I like going after those haters, man. I got to stop doing that. Um, the other one, uh, Melezadeh, this whole sneaker thing where they had like, they yeah, sort of sneak yeah, 6,000. That was How awesome. How wild is that, man? Yes. All these young kids thinking they were getting super awesome sneakers and were uh, joining a Ponzi scheme without their knowledge. Dude, it's nuts when you start seeing this revenue numbers, yeah. too. You're like, okay, so I, I was like... 70 million or something like yeah. that? Yeah, so my, usually how it works on Instagram, a lot of people will message me or email me, hey, here's a story. Well, whenever there's a second one, it's like, eh, there's something here. Whenever there's yeah. like three in a day, it's like, okay, this is indication I need to yeah. make a video. And like three or four people hit me up, but there's a Zade kicks in the shoe game. I don't know anything about the shoe game, but uh, I started looking at the story. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. And then the lawsuit comes out and the numbers get shared. I go, wait, this guy who doesn't even have any really public pictures made how much he was generating 60 million in revenue dude the numbers are bonkers on social media get your face out there try to sell something and that's one thing I'm, I'm trying to work on when i see all these stories it's very clear sell yeah and be comfortable with it for the longest time i was like oh i just i'll take the ad sense i don't do sponsorships or selling no if you have a good product or service sell it and don't be ashamed i I'm the one paying for my lawsuit. And that was when everything changed. And that's why I view it as like a positive. I think it's going to be a two steps back, 10 steps forward scenario. And that's why I'm like very much optimistic about it because it forced me into this kind of back against the wall. Yeah. I can't afford oh, this to perfect. rely on AdSense. So like I got to do sponsorships. Perfect. No one cared. I get paid way more. Great. Now I'm starting to do affiliates. I'm going to start focusing more on affiliates. Perfect. This is a way to make money long term. I hang out with people making six figures a month on YouTube. Madness. You know, I need to take what I learned from them. Um, so... My first course is 50 modules long. My second course is 64 modules long. And then I do three three-hour calls per week. Wow. One free call every other week and then this podcast. So my clients get to watch me 11 and a half hours per week. Wow. Plus the course that has 114. If I got hit by a bus today, it would take you 18 months to catch up wow. in MOA. You literally, like, I, I, t I tell my sales guys all the time, if I die, you should be able to sell this program for at least three years. Yeah. Like, that's how much content is in there. Because I was long-term thinking versus short-term thinking. When I saw these guys that, like, didn't even do anything. If you come, what well, tomorrow, what's it, today is uh, Monday, tomorrow when I do my call, if you came on my call tomorrow and you had seven hours of questions, I would stay on for seven hours until every single question was answered. Wow. Bro, and that's what I, because, again, it goes back to the, my paranoia watching fake gurus, mm -hmm. watching your channel, watching some, you know, pickup artists that had no idea what they were talking about. It's all short-term, too, what they do. Yeah, it is. When and you like, play that game. And I've had maybe three refunds ever. And wow, that's the, really good. The refunds were two guys were trying to scam me, and one of them, I he was snitching on one of my other clients. He was a snitch. Oh, he went. Wow. And he started screenshotting shit on my Discord server, and I'm like, "You have to go. I'm not interested. Like, you're a snitch." He when he was a, it wasn't like a moral thing. Nobody was assaulted. He was just being a snitch for no reason. He had to go. The other than that, I've those are the only guys I've ever had had refunds. I do have one other problem, and that is when I have a guy. This is a big issue for me. A guy, because it's, it's not a dating program, but yes, women are a pretty big component of the, of the status part of it. Uh, guys who pay women for sex or their sugar daddies, they join my program and then I, I, I tell them they think they have game. Do you understand the problem? Because the outcome's the same. They, but, but the way but to get they, there. they legitimately think that because they talked a prostitute down from 2,500 to 1,500, they have game. Oh, wow. And then, they, then they'll join my program and they've been paying prostitutes their whole life. And then I'll have this like really fucking weird issue where I'm like, hey, bro, we have to start over. Got to fix your Instagram. No, I don't need my Instagram. I just do the thing. I just walk up to these girls and then they go home with me. I'm like, they're prostitutes. That's why you're forgetting the part where you pay them. <laughs> and they're the hardest when they're the ones who like don't open up the program. They want me to fix all their problems. And then they get really angry with me. And it's like, the, that's an issue I have. Like kind of, I'm to the point where I kind of wish those guys wouldn't join my program because you have to work pretty hard. Yeah. But that, that has been an issue that I've had. Like, because I'm so- Maybe something in the marketing or the messaging. Yeah. Maybe well, no, they don't listen. They don't give a shit. Ah, true. The, the, problem, the problem with my marketing messaging is that it's just me with a bunch of hot girls. Right? And I don't even <laughs> say the word dating. Everyone wants it. Yeah. That's yeah. It. But uh, back to the affiliate game and yeah. the beauty of our content is long term. Like we're still new into this space. For sure. Yeah. Long term is crazy. Like there's podcasts I go back and, and have watched of yours that are you may have filmed a year ago or something or six months ago or th even three yeah. months ago right and you can still enjoy it today and the the sponsors help today's money because you get paid up front yeah however the affiliate game you get the long term so some yeah. of these videos are still racking up views and unfortunately my audience isn't necessarily my my platform isn't 
a, a very easy filter or funnel mm. into a product, which is the downside of what I do. However, if there is a right product or service and you put it in the description and you get you know a nice affiliate link, dude, if you do this for every video, I'm at like 250 videos now that have real views. Mm. Imagine if every single video I had some type of legitimate affiliate, like Amazing. the amount of money you can make over time. And this is how the people who you alluded to earlier were like, wait, you make seven figures a month? Can you explain this? Like, yeah, I've been doing this for five years and I have all these affiliates. YouTubers making, when they make a hundred grand a month and they've got all these affiliate codes from so long. Yeah. It's bonkers. Bro, you're welcome. We'll send you affiliate code today. <laughs> you ain't got to ask me twice. You got, you're more than welcome to help me with my product. Um, the, the other one, the, the last one I want to ask you about. So Ty Lopez, what was your ultimate conclusion about what Ty was doing? And maybe even Robert, Robert I was Kiyosaki. thinking I was thinking about Ty Lopez on the way here. Yeah. If you ask my audience, if you took a poll, what they believe my perception of Ty Lopez is versus what it actually is would be vastly different. I think you respect him a lot. A, a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So I think he's wildly intelligent. Yes. I think he understood the game more than others. Yes. And what I found is when people, there are some people out there that don't feel, they don't have fear of like being shamed or being called a fake guru or, or being, having video, negative videos about them. He understood this better than anyone. He, all of it was attention to Ty Lopez. He made bonkers money. People don't understand this. He was making insane levels of money. His ad was annoying. Was it? Well, it made him a hundred million, you know, whatever the number is. He was, insane he told money. me it was 60 grand an hour. So I was with him one oh time at an, at an affiliate conference. We were at the Roosevelt and I was hanging out with him and he said, so I was there. I didn't know this was happening, but this is when, this is like 2013 when the ad comes out and the ad is, he, he uh, you know, he said, so you understand it's an ad. The ad says, click on this link. It's a 90 minute VSL that it right. say, sends you to, which takes you to 67 steps. At least a hundred million he made off that. He said during, wow. when that thing first came out and it started taking off, he was saying, he, I think he said on my podcast, he was doing 60 grand an hour is how wow. much money that they were pulling from that. Now, here's the other part. It's totally scalable, infinitely yeah, scalable. it is. Because it was a video course, which is why my video course is the way that it is. I have a video, like I, I keep telling my, my sales guys, if I get hit by a bus, we should still be able to sell this fucking course because it's so, there's, it's so in depth. So yeah, that's what he did. That was the magic of it. And then we're talking, nobody was spending millions a month on right. YouTube and ads. he was still getting it at a very, very affordable rate. His and he CPM, talks about like Google, yeah. he was doing the Google stuff now. Yeah. All this stuff, yeah, I'd love to verify if he actually did it. But the thing is, whenever someone was driving exotics and flying private before social media, yeah. your argument doesn't hold much weight when you're like, he only made his money by selling a course. Eh, he clearly had money before it. Yeah, he was, uh, he was some dating websites. Yeah, did, and did that's, you, that's the this? criticism I would have yeah. is there's some reports and uh, it seems like there's some truth to it where he was doing the, there's a, there's a black hat way to grow uh -huh. uh, a lot of money in affiliate game or selling stuff. And that is the reoccurring model. And what some guys do, which was considered black hat is you would do the sign up like, Oh, Hey, it's a dollar sign up for a dollar for seven days. And then, or sign up for $10 for, for this course. And they don't know, they don't show you that it's actually a reoccurring. Mm. And so then they get you on reoccurring in the, the real true black hat way is to not even mention it. And this is completely illegal mm. to not even mention it to the customer. So when they sign up for $10 for access to this, whatever, and they put in their credit card information, they don't realize that it's a reoccurring model. Mm. So people might not realize it until six months later, and then they go to cancel and they can't contact anyone and they don't know, who do you go to the police? And there was a lot of people alluding to the fact that he was doing mm. this with the dating. And so I don't know the truth, but I brought it up because it seems like that's possible where he was doing some of this with the dating apps. He might've been bringing in beautiful women that didn't actually, actually exist, like fake profiles. People were signing up and then not able to cancel. Well, if you think about it, if you're running ads and you're getting uh, a product that is a one-to-one -one conversion, yeah. but then you get the monthly after that and you're not letting them cancel four months later. Oh, we just saw your call or just saw your email yeah. and you're getting them for $40 instead of 10. Yeah. Well, you're making a lot of money. I'm not accusing him of doing that. I just, there was a lot of people mentioning that he was. Notice it wasn't, the problem wasn't like the content that he had. I learned a lot yeah. from, some, from right. some of his content. I, shout out to Ty. I bootlegged a bunch of his shit. You I want to know something funny yeah. that a lot of people probably wouldn't expect. Yeah. I was following Ty when no one knew of him uh. because when I was deep into RSD, they, Tyler hung out with this guy, Ty Lopez, and then he had a YouTube channel. Yeah, and it was, you remember me in the video? With, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and he had this this cool bookshelf behind him, and he was reading a book a day. And I even I even was doing a book a day because I was influenced by him yeah. on my on uh, a different channel I had where I would read, yeah. a, read a chapter and do a summary. But with Ty, he would do this like book a day, read a chapter, and it very much influenced me. And I loved his content. And then he like blew up, and it became a whole different thing. I knew of him way before yeah. anyone else. And he was hanging out with Owen and the RSD guys. Those were some wild times, man. Oh, I bet. Yeah. I bet. So I have a lot of respect for him. Uh, I would love to know if he did anything illegal or shady. Obviously, he wouldn't share that publicly. Yeah. I think he's uh, a very, very intelligent dude. And I, I'm very interested to see what he does with Rev. 
because I think there, I think there's some marketing claims that he's using that might not be. He, he's kind of adhering to the same internet marketing thing, which is like over promote, over promise, deliver. Is he delivering it as good as it is? I don't know. Um, but hey, look, there were a lot of people yeah. that made a lot of money with this social media. It was a social media marketing. Social media marketing. Agency. Like yeah. a lot of people started agencies and made money. So how am I going to clown on someone who actually created a course I mean, where a lot of people had he, success? He, a lot of people made money on his crypto product too. I mean, because he was oh, really? when he was talking about doing it, it wasn't even at forty k. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Uh, like yeah. on the run up, he he had a crypto product before it ran up to sixty. Mm. So potentially people made some money from that as well. Uh, the other one I was going to ask you is what with Robert Kiyosaki. What I thought was interesting is that your criticism was not of him and, or his knowledge. Yeah, it was some of the sales practices. Yes, same kind and of thing. His, he are you familiar with these real estate seminars? Uh, vaguely. I. The way you had vitriol towards that Nick Ritchie guy yeah. is how I have it. These real yeah. estate seminars are the scammiest business. I literally have a video of the scammiest business model in the world. I am so against this model, which is bring people in person, use emotions to hype them up, and then oh, make massive, massive, massive over promises. And then you sell them in the back of the room. There's nothing wrong with selling in person. But the way these these seminars were held, it was it's just so scammy. And they have used so many different psychological principles to get people to buy in. And basically oversell people, and he was he was doing this. Beautiful. There, there was there was like real criminal stuff that they were doing, which is they were getting people to lie to their credit card companies. They say, "Hey, look." Okay, I didn't know about this. Oh yeah, yeah. no, they, no, this was a whole thing. Wow. And that they were um, they were saying, you know, with this new program, we're going to teach you. We're going to teach you how to make, wait. You make twenty k a year. We're going to teach you how to make hundred k a year. Call Amex and say my new salary just bumped to hundred k a year. You know why they did that? Now that their credit card limit is higher. Now they can spend more for the program. Their program did not have a specific cost. It was a variable cost based on, so they had a whole system where you had a mentor where they, uh, the person who helped you assisted you get more credit for the, for the real estate, but yeah. no, it's really the program. They would help you get the credit. They would tell the other person like, hey, this person, 40K is, is their max. So then they would charge them like 35 for so the program. So they would d do dynamic price changing. Yeah. This is why you can never so, find a price online for so, it. So it's funny because we don't show a price for our, I mean, I'll tell you right now, it's like 3,500, 5,000, 8,500. The reason why we don't do it though is because we qualify people to see whether or not they can afford it. Because we have right. so many people want to sign up for my program. Right. No offense to you guys from India or your college students who are broke. You just yeah. probably can't afford my program. Right. And so we put you guys with a setter or we bring you to my free call. I still want to help people who can't afford my program. Yeah. I am very, my it's favorite, a great way running business. my favorite fucking calls are my free calls. I love the shit out of doing those calls. And I, and I tell guys, I'll stay on here for seven hours. I will stay on here until every single one of you gets your question answered. But yeah, it was one of those situations. And I had people in these telegram groups like, oh, it's because you're doing dynamic pricing. I'm like, bitch, no, I'm not. I'm not doing that at all. We just had, for us, it was a situation where we were getting way too many unqualified leads and we had one hour blocks set for, for sales calls. And it yeah. was screwing up our, our process. You know, when you have a funnel, like an actual funnel, you're saving everyone time. Absolutely. Everyone, I'm not wasting your time. Here's some free literature. Come subscribe to the podcast. Come on the free Monday call. Jump on the Discord server. Oh, you want to buy a fifteen thousand dollar product? Let's get you signed up right now. Those are two different people. Right. I, don't, I don't want to waste either one of their times. You understand what I'm saying? So Agreed. that's essentially how that worked out. With the house hacking thing, I do. I have one living client per per month. I nice. love. I love. I love having roommates. I, I got a buddy who's in the dating space who has clients come and stay with him. Yeah. He does it better than me. I mean, dude's making like 15 grand a month from his clients coming yeah. to stay with them. I, I love, I love having those dudes like they're, cause they're so motivated, bro. Yeah. That's one of my favorite things is working with people. Who are so motivated. my goal with house hacking yeah. has been to house hack my way into McDonald Highlands. Oh familiar yeah. Remember that neighborhood? Yes. Very my familiar. Favorite, Dragon Ridge. Hey, I'll take you to uh, you've been to 750 Dragon Ridge. I, I've driven, every time I go you, in there, I drive You know the Wish house. Mansion? Yes. I'll take you to yeah. party at the Wish Mansion, for sure. Oh, that would be super shout dope. Out, shout out to Peter. All right, guys, thank you so much for checking us out. Where can we find you? Spencer Cornelia on YouTube. Okay. That's and then it. On Instagram, where is Spencer that? Spencer Cornelia one Okay. I'm not real too active on Instagram. Follow my YouTube. If you like my YouTube, great. Okay. If not, that's cool too. But I'm, I try to make entertaining videos, so hopefully it's, you like it's it. It's addicting, man. I really try to not take on like new addictive channels. Your channel is one I can't stop listening to all the stuff that you do. So make sure you guys check out Spencer. If you want to learn about being a content creator, check out Spencer. The way he edits his videos, all that stuff. Again, we try to learn and grow. I only every single thing I do in this business, I try to do from stealing from somebody else who is is. Um, is successful. And I say steal because it gets across the idea. I am unapologetically doing it the way that they taught me, whether it's Cole Gordon, whether it's Nick Cosmo, whether it's Bradley, whether it's Ryan Stuman, whether it's Dan Fleischman, whether it's Dan Bilzerian, I created a brand that I sell my pro program from 
That's Ty Lopez and Dan Bilzerian. That's where I got that idea from. All these things I took from somebody who's smarter than me and having the humility to recognize they're smart. You make better YouTube videos than I do. So I recognize somebody is smarter than me and I try to try to learn as much as I can. Humble yourself and find mentors. Thank you guys so much for checking us out. Once again, I cannot, uh, I cannot express to you. I'm finally, I'm five episodes ahead. I can't believe this. This is not going to, this is going to come out next week, but I'm five. Sweet. I can't because I'm going to Jamaica. I'm so excited by all the people who've reached out to me to come on my podcast. Thank you guys. I'm still so humbled by it. I'm never going to get to a point where I'm just like, oh God, I got to fucking interview this guy. I'm so, the fact that I get to do this for a living is a blessing and you guys are the reason for it. Thank you so much. And I'll see you all next week.